of the low public esteem in which Congress is held, perceived inefficiency, legislative gridlock, and the often strained relations between the legislative and executive branches have heightened the call for a new comprehensive review of the institution. Coming up next, we take you up to Capitol Hill for coverage of a House Rules Committee hearing. Members met earlier today to discuss House Concurrent Resolution 192. The purpose of the bill would be the establishment of a joint committee on the organization of Congress to study and recommend reforms on the operation of the House and Senate. The committee, which would be composed of eight members from each body, would look for ways to simplify Congress's operations, improve the consideration of legislation, and streamline interchamber relations. Committee members would be required to make recommendations to the House and Senate by the end of the 102nd Congress. The Rules Committee is charged with coming up with the debate guidelines that accompany each piece of legislation. The chairman of the panel is Democratic Congressman Joseph Moakley of Massachusetts. Rules Committee will now come to order. I want to be perfectly clear this morning that I don't care what Dan Quayle says, I still love Murphy Brown. TV coverage. I know. Today the committee will begin deliberations on H. Conrez 192, better known as the Har Hamilton Gratison Bill which would establish a temporary House Senate Committee to study and recommend reforms in the Congress. Although the bill does not outline specific areas for review, it's my understanding that it is the intent of the authors of the legislation that the new commission look into issues that fall under five broad categories. Mr. Chairman, excuse me, with all due respect, are we gonna have the TV cameras on today or? Oh, I'm sorry. I think they already all. Uh, have to have a motion. I'm sorry. There's been a request for filming of today's proceedings. Is there any objection? Chair sure, has uh, none. I guess not. Oh. <coughs> Excuse me for interrupting. That. That's all right. I, I should have made the motion okay. first. To look into five broad categories, procedural reform, budget process reform, committee reform, oversight, and public perception. All of these categories, in my view, are legitimate and important areas for study. We should try to improve the way our legislative bodies operate. We should try to make the Congress more efficient. We should try to make this place more effective, and we should do whatever we can to restore public confidence in this institution. But in order to do that, we must proceed carefully. We must be sure that any reforms we accept are good reforms and actually improve the current conditions and not make them worse. And that requires a full and thorough and constructive debate on this matter, and that won't happen overnight. I know there is a temptation to move fast, to force a newly proposed commission to come up with an immediate list of reforms that we can quickly vote on, but quite frankly, I think that would be a mistake. None of us are experts on these things, and I'm sure in this current political climate, I'm not sure how many of us can be objective. We should therefore take the time to listen and learn before we reach conclusions. I know this is an election year that members are worried about uh, how we can look like reformers as we face the It used to be It used to be that all we wanted to be was the education candidate or the jobs candidate. Now everybody wants to be the reform candidate, whatever that means. I know it's fashionable to bash Congress these days, and I know it's popular to blame the current system for all our problems and for our inability to get things done. But to be truthful, I think that it's a little more complicated than that. Perhaps our biggest problem is that we have a divided government, that we have to take a Republican, we have a Republican president who wants to take us in one direction and a Democratic Congress who wants to go in a different direction. Let me be clear, I'm certain that any commission on reform that Congress approves can eventually come up with sound recommendations on how we can make this place better, and I welcome that. 
but I want to be, make sure that anything we ultimately do is dictated by what's best for this institution and for this country and not by election year politicking. And I hope as we listen to the testimonies today that we can keep this committee, uh, can keep all the 30-second political soundbites to a minimum. The C-SPAN viewers are not as interested in what we have to say as what we, our distinguished panel has to say. Mr. Solomon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, first of all, let me welcome um, our distinguished guests who have been with us before, and uh, particularly John Erdenborn, one of our former colleagues who can certainly uh, bear a lot of light on, uh, on the problems that we have uh, in the past. And secondly, Mr. Chairman, I want to commend you on scheduling these important hearings on the need to create a bipartisan joint committee on the organization of Congress to study the problems of this institution and there are problems, and to make recommendations for its reform, and the reform is badly needed. I also want to commend the authors of this resolution, Mr. Uh, Hamilton and Mr. Grattison, on introducing it back in July of last year, and on their tireless efforts to uh, bring it to, to this hearing uh, process, and we'll hear from them tomorrow. As a co-sponsor of the resolution, as well as the author in February of last year of House Resolution 85 to create a similar House Commission on Legislative Process Reform, I think this day is really long overdue. But I commend both you and I commend the Speaker of the House for now recognizing the need to proceed with this critical task and, and to do it today. As you know, Mr. Chairman, when we both served on the Bipartisan Leadership Task Force on Administrative Reform uh, earlier this year, it was the position of the Republican leadership that there should be some linkage between House administerial reform and procedural reforms. We felt that they should really go hand in hand. And the most the speaker could agree to at that time, if you recall, was support for the creation of this joint committee and for a uh, more immediate bipartisan reform effort to make recommendations to our party caucuses this year for consideration when we organize uh, the 103rd Congress. And as the member who pressed the most on that task force for some real procedural reforms this year, I have submitted an amendment to this committee, to the speaker, and to the Republican leader, and to the authors of this resolution calling on the House membership of the Joint Committee to make such a recommendation as they deem appropriate for internal procedural reforms of the House no later than September 30th. And I'm flexible on that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that date, if we want to uh, delay it some in order to take out the politics, uh, we could even move that up to October 31st. And by that time, uh, certainly it could not interfere with any kind of election or could not be used for you know, partisan uh, political purposes. It's my strong feeling and that of our leadership that we shouldn't have to wait for another year or even two years for joint committee final recommendations to begin improving the House. The House needs to be improved right now. There will be strong sentiment for immediate change when the new Congress convenes, as you all know, on January 3rd of next year. Uh, and if we, I think we'd be really remiss in our responsibilities if we did not provide some kind of constructive proposals to address that mood and that need when we adopt our rules for the beginning of the 103rd Congress. Now, Mr. Chairman and members, I will not take the time of this committee now to enumerate all of the changes which have been proposed by myself in my resolution or the Republican conference in uh, their resolution, but suffice it to say there is a growing bipartisan consensus that we have become muscle-bound by our burgeoning and bureaucratic system of a really subcommittee government in which everybody has a piece of the action, but no one has any real power, purpose, or accountability except when it comes to protecting their own turf. And I know that's difficult. We must reduce the sub subcommittees, we must reduce the staff as good as they are, and we must reduce the multiple bill referrals, uh, which we've just gone through with this, uh, with this energy bill yesterday and we'll be uh, debating here for the next two days. And we have to give the members fewer and more focused responsibilities if we are to legislate in a truly conscientious, deliberative, and responsive fashion. 
One specific change which I have long favored, Mr. Chairman, in order to cut back on committees and subcommittees uh, is the creation of a joint committee on intelligence as recommended by Congressman Hyde and myself. And I think Mr. Bielenson uh, uh, is much, very much aware of the, these proposals as well. It would have the distinct advantage of eliminating the current duplication of effort by the two houses of better overseeing the intelligence community and of better protecting our national security secrets as well. It is my hope that the proposed Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress will take a real hard look at this proposal since it is specifically charged in the resolution which we're going to be acting on today with improving the working relations both between the two houses and between the branches of government. And finally, in summation, Mr. Chairman, it is my hope that the Joint Committee will not be intimidated by those who are really wedded to the status quo, since it is clear to most people that we need a new Congress for a new century ahead of us. Too many reform efforts in the past have been undermined and they've been destroyed. You and I served on those committees by those who are more interested in maintaining their personal power than in strengthening the institution as a whole. And we must not let that happen again if we are to hold any hope of any kind of comprehensive and meaningful reform of this Congress, which is so desperately needed and demanded by the American people. So I really look forward to the testimony of our distinguished witnesses here today and, uh, uh, and we're working on them and about bringing back some real comprehensive reform. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Solomon. Mr. Derrick. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, let me say that I think uh, that Congress is a very productive body and uh, represents uh, the wishes of the people of this country uh, very well. We are not perfect, and we must always strive to become better at what we do. Uh, I first came to Congress in 1974 as a Watergate baby. My freshman colleagues and I were swept into office on a wave of reform that followed one of the worst political scandals in our history, a president just having resigned, the first in the history of our country. Then as now, citizens were dissatisfied with their government and demanding change. The House responded to their demands and institutionalized various changes, primarily centered around the committee system. From the day I was elected, I had to confront the notion of reforming an institution in which I had never served. Now that I have served nearly 18 years, I am more convinced than ever that Congress must continually evaluate itself, making changes where needed. The resolution we are examining today is an excellent step in that direction. I can think of various changes in the way I would like to see Congress operate. I am sure every member has his own ideas, some of which may be similar to mine, some not. However, one thing we should bear in mind is that Congress, composed of 535 individuals representing 50 diverse states, will seldom work at lightning speed. I don't believe it should. I don't believe that our founding fathers intended for it to do so. The framers intended Congress to be the deliberative branch of government, thoroughly studying and debating issues and acting for the betterment of the country through consensus. That is how we should tackle congressional reform. We should examine the institution carefully and comprehensively, identify the specific problems, and then work towards curing them. The last thing we need is to make hasty changes in the name of reform and wind up <coughs> excuse me, trading our current problems for new ones <coughs> without improving the institution's overall uh, operation overall. And I might say that I was a member of that Watergate class, and we probably instituted more reforms than any other class, le at least in, in recent history. And uh, when I made those uh, reforms, I thought that they were all excellent, that the institution needed, that I had a great insight that no one else had, uh, and that my class did, and that we were going to change things for the better, and this was going to the institution was going to be substantially different. Having had time to reflect on those changes that we made, uh, I'm not sure that I would have made uh, quite a few of them. I think it decentralized uh, uh, the way this body operates. It cut back on its effectiveness. It was did mean that it was more inclusive, but it, uh, <clears throat> it crippled to a large degree <clears throat> 
the uh, ability of our leaders to lead. So uh, I guess the reason I point that out is that I think that we have to be very deliberative in what we do and very careful that uh, we don't do things just because it appears at the moment that that might be the thing to, uh, to do because of one particular passing situation or another. HCON Res 192 would provide a framework and a forum for the kind of careful examination needed. We need in order to make Congress do the people's work more effectively. HCON Res 192 would allow present and former members as well as outside experts to contemplate and recommend to, e to each House the reform measures they may deem worthwhile. Earlier this year, the House adopted a landmark administrative reform package. HCON Res 192 would pick up where that reform left off, examining the procedural and structural operations of both houses of Congress and their interaction with the executive and judicial branches. HCON Res 192 is a solid, bipartisan tool to continue the process of reform. And I thank my colleagues, Mr. Hamilton, and, Mr. and I thank them, my colleagues, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Gratison, for introducing it. So again, Mr. Chairman, I am eager to hear from our distinguished witnesses on this most pressing issue, and thank you for convening thank this you. hearing. Thank you, Mr. Dark. Mr. Dryer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a, a prepared statement, but I'd like to respond to a couple of things that I've already heard. And uh, the chairman gave us the great admonition, the C-SPAN audience doesn't want to hear from us, they want to hear from you all. So uh, I think that uh, if one looks at what was just said by my good friend from, friend from South Carolina, we should be deliberative. And uh, it's obvious that we can't deal with this reform issue overnight. But the experience that this committee had yesterday was something that was clearly unprecedented in my uh, time here, and I don't know when uh, I've ever heard of an instance where nine committees played a role in one piece of legislation, and uh, we uh, had the uh, distinguished Republican Chairman Emeritus of the committee, Mr. Quillen, say, uh, haste makes waste. Last night when we were uh, caucusing in a bipartisan fashion in Mr. Moakley's office, he made it very clear that we should not be ramming through this energy bill as we now are. And it seems to me that as we look at these reforms, yes, Butler is absolutely right. We should be deliberative. But at the same time, it seems to me that as we look at what many are predicting will be an unprecedented number of new members coming to the House and the Senate in January of 1993, I believe that we have no choice other than to put in place some kind of package which will take the recommendations, which uh, I understand uh, Mr. Ornstein plans to have by this fall, I hope, so that we could take action and uh, be ready to hit the ground running when this new 103rd Congress <laughs> takes uh, takes office. So I look forward to that, and I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Billingson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a prepared statement either, um, other than to say, if, if I may, that uh, I think we obviously do need to institute some reforms around here, and I welcome this opportunity, as I'm sure all of my colleagues from both parties do, to take a look at this resolution, to pass it in some form, and, to, and we look forward to the results of whatever this, this joint committee um, comes up with. I would like to say that despite the fact that we obviously have to make improvements around here in the Congress, should point out that which I suppose everybody really is aware of, that it's not just the Congress that's at fault. We have, if I may say so, and I do not say this in a, I mean not to say this in a partisan way, we've lacked leadership from the top, from the President in a number of areas, which has prevented us, I think, from getting some things done which need to be done in this country. We do have, as our distinguished chairman pointed out in his opening remarks, divided government, Republican president, Democratic-dominated Congress. People back home have to understand that, that there is a certain tension there, that things can't get done nearly so easily. In fact, at times, I suppose we, we believe that people send us here in that way. I mean, I think people consciously send us uh, a president from one party and a, and a majority from the other party in, uh, in the Congress to, in order to balance things out, but that also as, as we all know, does produce a, a divided government, one which is not often able to, to act even when uh, folks back home think we, we ought to do so. Mr. Solomon is anxious for us to move quickly, and I quite agree with him. At the same time, 
I also I also pay some attention to what our good friend from South Carolina, Mr. Mr. Derrick, said. We have to we have to move carefully. It may well be that there are some things that could be done very quickly, and some other more difficult things which will take a little bit longer. I notice, Mr. Mr. Chairman, we really have a lot on our. Or not we, but this, this proposed committee has a lot on its menu, on its plate. You mentioned yourself, sir, procedural reform, budget process reform, committee reform, oversight, and fifth, public perception, which I guess perhaps depends on what we do with, with the first four. But that's a lot of things. I'll just say one thing to my, my friends on the committee. I recall back in 1982 to 1984, I had the honor of serving as, as, a, as the chairman of a little task force of this, of this committee on, but on budget process reform. We worked very hard, very diligently, did a pretty good job, I think, and, and was totally bipartisan effort. But it took us two years, two full years, and we held lots of hearings and lots of seminars and so on, uh, just, on just on budget process reform. So it may well be that when this committee is put into operation, as, as we all hope <coughs> it soon will be, perhaps it can divide up its, its work. Perhaps some things can be done more quickly than others. But things that need to be looked at particularly carefully may take a little bit longer, and I don't think we should I don't think we should hurry them along any faster than they, than they ought to be. As long as we are involved in the process of fixing the place up and start making some progress along the way, I think that's enough, and I don't think we should push it too, too quickly, except there, as I suggested earlier, there may well be some relatively, relatively simple, perhaps relatively modest, but useful things that we can do very quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bailen, sir. Mr. Gordon. As my friend from California suggested, I think that we should be listening more than talking here, and, I, and I'm anxious to hear this very distinguished panel get started. So I'm just going to very briefly say that I think this is, these are important hearings, important uh, because I think the public demands that this, this institution work better, and uh, it needs to work better. And I think it's also important because we have seen this year the largest number of members of Congress choose not to run for election in modern history. And I think there's a reason for that, and that reason uh, to some extent results from the job as a member of Congress now has become a, a seven day a week, uh, 12 month a year job, uh, which our constituents are demanding our attention uh, day in and day out, and so are our legislative uh, bodies here. Uh, and that's not so bad, but then you put on top of that that not only ourselves, but also our families are in a fishbowl of the public, uh, whether it's the media or whatever, day in and day out, 24 hours a day. That raises the stake a little, little bit more when you're, as a friend of mine the other day was telling me about uh, a bus driver that was taking their small child to school, was comp talking about their father being a member of Congress and making some, some, some derogatory remarks. That raises the stakes. But that's fine. That's what we're here for. If we feel like we're getting something done, and by and large, I think there is an enormous amount of talented uh, individuals uh, here on both sides of the aisles that may have differing opinions, uh, but their, I guess, common denominator is a patriotism and a, and a really desire to see their country move forward in the best possible way. But when you feel like that you're not making a difference, and when you feel like you're being bogged down day to day uh, in the legislative process, then you wonder, is it worthwhile? Is it worth the sacrifices? It is if you're getting something done. I've had a very productive legislative year, and it really gives me a new enthusiasm. Um, but if I hadn't been had those successes legislatively, it would just about wear you down. And so I think we're seeing so many of our colleagues leave because they are being worn down, because they're not getting something done. And I think that that's why this hearing is so important, so that we can get the body moving better for the public, and we can get the body moving better so that the talented folks within will want to stay uh, and do the good job that they're capable of. And so I'm glad you're here, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing what you say. Thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. We'll, we'll start now uh, hearing from the witnesses on H. Con Res 192 from the Rules Committee. And it's my pleasure to, uh, to uh, introduce uh, Norman J. Ornstein, resident scholar of American Enterprise Institute, and Dr. Thomas E. Mann, Director of Governmental Studies at the Brookings Institute. Gentlemen. Um. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure and an honor to be uh, in front of the Rules Committee, uh, and particularly today uh, for uh, us to be here to testify on uh, House Concurrent Resolution 192. Uh, because our views are uh, almost <coughs> identical on this subject, and also uh, because we're directing a joint AEI and Brookings uh, project uh, to evaluate the Congress and make some uh, recommendations uh, uh, that we hope will uh, 
be uh, useful to the joint committee and also to the party caucuses uh, uh, a little bit further down the road. We have joint testimony today. We're not going to read our testimony. Uh, we hope you'll in include it in the record. Without objection, uh, the gentleman's uh, both statements will be included in the record. Thank you. Uh, I'll make a few brief comments and then Tom will as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, a, a part of the reason that we're here now is because uh, Congress is undergoing a virtually unprecedented time of uh, vitriol and vilification of the institution from outside and from inside. Uh, it's clear that uh, many of the people uh, outside and inside uh, who are focusing on this institution want to do for it what uh, the rioters have done for South Central Los Angeles. Uh, they just as soon uh, uh, burn the place down and uh, figure that what we're left with will be better than what we have now. Uh, we're not uh, uh, in that group. Uh, we think uh, that uh, this is a time for very good reasons to focus on change in the institution, but not because the institution is irreparably broken, not because, as many would suggest, it is the main or even the, uh, much less the sole source of problems in making policy work in this uh, society uh, or uh, making things happen. Uh, we have a lot of problems, uh, no question. There are problems that relate to all of the institutions of government and also to institutions outside and to uh, voters themselves. We have to put all of this into context. We do not think that uh, this is a time for reform simply because uh, outside pressures brought by reporting of scandal uh, or public criticism should drive us to change. There are other much better and more constructive reasons to focus on change right now. First is simply because uh, there's a need for a periodic look at all complex institutions in society. And indeed, when we look back over uh, the course of American history, very few institutions have been willing to look at themselves and change themselves internally uh, as uh, much uh, and uh, in as responsive a fashion as Congress has. It's uh, time for another uh, reassessment. And as uh, Butler Derrick was saying earlier, we had a wave of changes. We had uh, changes brought about by a joint committee on Congress uh, in 1970. We had a series of changes that began in the late 60s that culminated uh, with the class of 1974. And it's time to reassess the previous generations of reform, look at where we are, what worked, what didn't, what's been changed since then, and try and strike uh, an appropriate kind of balance, learning from uh, uh, the past and uh, uh, helping it build towards a better future. I think there's another good reason for looking at the institution right now, and it's a reason, as we suggested the last time we were here before the committee, for looking at all of our institutions of government. We are in a post-Cold War world. And most of the basic structures of the federal government were really set in place uh, in the aftermath of World War II with an eye towards the Cold War. And some of those institutions uh, really need to be looked at simply afresh because the world has changed. The emphasis, the policy directions that we're taking may have changed. Some of the institutions that we've set in place, the way in which we look, for example, at international economic policy, clearly is based on a vision of the past where this was not an essential uh, element, and now it is. There are other areas that are fragmented because they weren't critical issues, and now they are more, and we need to do that as well. And clearly, too, today we have more problems of communication between the branches, not just between Congress and the executive, but between Congress and the courts, uh, with the courts playing an increasingly uh, a assertive role in interpreting what Congress is doing. Uh, and not, uh, as they often say, deferring to congressional judgment. We've got to rethink all of those things. So for all of those reasons, we commend uh, the initiative taken by the original four uh, co-sponsors of this concurrent resolution, uh, Representatives Hamilton and Gratison, Senators Bourne and Domenici, and we urge you to report it favorably to the House and make whatever modifications uh, you see as necessary to make it, uh, to make it work. Uh, just a couple of additional points. We, we also believe that it's worth taking a look at Congress because there are a lot of myths floating out uh, around out there about the Congress. What it's supposed to do, it is not, as several of you have said, supposed to be simply an efficient processor of the laws. Uh, it's not supposed to act just like that on legislation. Uh, it's supposed to take into account the wide-ranging views uh, that exist in this uh, disparate society. Uh, and uh, we also believe that uh, we've got to take a careful look at uh, political parties and think through what the role of parties and their leaders ought to be. 
we've got to go back and look at the balance between decentralization and centralization uh, that exists, knowing that today we've got uh, a, a degree of partisan tension in this institution that needs to be addressed. And it may be the way to address it is to build stronger parties, uh, perhaps uh, ironically, uh, in both cases, uh, and to, uh, uh, to uh, work at building uh, stronger leaders. And one other point, finally, here. Clearly, uh, we should not be doing this in response simply to public opinion, as I've suggested earlier, and as uh, you have as well. But we know we've got another problem now, I believe, which is that the opinion leaders in the society uh, have turned, in many cases, against Congress now. Close observers and those who have been around this institution before, who have always felt uh, a, a greater appreciation for the sophistication of its operations, for the different needs and pushes and pulls that members have had, are getting caught up now in this fervor of uh, Congress bashing. Uh, looking at the institution now in a serious way uh, is something that I hope will not so much alter the public view, and there's always an undercurrent of distaste for Congress and bashing of politicians, but bring a lot of those opinion leaders back to uh, appreciating the important uh, intrinsic role that it plays uh, in the institution. Now let me turn now to uh, my colleague. Mr. Mann. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm... Excuse me. We're going to keep going, so some of us are going to come, run vote and come right back. Okay. okay. Delighted to, to be back with you. The last time I was here, I uh, voiced some skepticism about a congressional question period, and at the end of our discussion, indicated that I thought a more, a much more constructive and serious effort was brewing in the form of the Hamilton Gratison resolution, and, and I'm happy to appear here this morning to testify on behalf of it. Now, let's be honest, we wouldn't be here if, uh, if Congress wasn't under siege. Uh, uh, the point, though, is not, not to do it as a, as, as a way of rescuing Congress uh, from its uh, abysmal public standing now, because the odds are it won't do it. The, that is, the chances are you're not going to be able to make organizational procedural changes in a way that's going to transform public uh, views of the institution. Rather, though, you should see it as an opportunity to do something that needs doing in any case, uh, that is to, to marshal and channel all of this energy that will come in with the new freshman class, some of it based on irrational attacks on the institution, on myths about it, but to harness it in a way that you can accomplish some constructive changes to make this a better institution. I mean, I appear before you today as someone who believes that a strong Congress is essential to a strong country. That we don't want to weaken this institution, we want to strengthen it. We want to find its comparative advantages and, and uh, build on those and make it a much more formidable institution in the American political process. As Norm suggested, there's been a terrible loss of confidence, a loss of faith within the political community uh, as far as Congress is concerned. Uh, as one of your colleagues said, we've moved from healthy skepticism to uh, corrosive cynicism about, uh, about the institution. My view is that a serious effort at organizational s renewal uh, will help to restore faith, first of all, among among the participants and close observers, and eventually this will penetrate uh, to the larger public. So that's why it's, it's important to do. Now, I, I'd just like to make a, a couple, of, couple of points. One is th there's a real difference between this period in 1992 and 1974, as Mr. Derrick suggested. Back in 74, there was a clear diagnosis as to what was wrong and a prescription as to what to do. There was a, a good deal of agreement about, about the institution's problems and the ways of dealing with them. I would suggest to you there's no such agreement today on what's wrong and how to fix it. Um, and therefore, a deliberate effort at, at uh, organizational and procedural analysis is prerequisite to taking the steps that are essential for, uh, for getting something done. Uh, 
of a, of a very constructive sort. The danger of this effort is, is apparent to all of us. If, I mean, we understand the reluctance of, uh, of some members to engage in, in this uh, kind of effort. Sometimes it ends up reinforcing criticisms and stereotypes rather than uh, dispelling them. There's plenty of history of reform efforts that have failed. A lot of members would like to push this to the side, roll up their sleeves and deal with the problems themselves. And there's one big additional worry. Uh, the worry is that in this environment of a very intense partisan suspicion and conflict, that one side will use the process as a way of waging warfare against the other. The Democrats are suspicious of the Republicans. The Republicans are suspicious of, uh, of the Democrats. It is extremely important to, to set this operation up in a way that you can push those sort of partisan calculations to the side as best as you can. That means don't don't do much publicly before the election. Uh, you, for the most part, let it, let it build and be dealt with af after uh, the election. There are, there are deep suspicions, and if this is allowed to become fodder for partisan warfare, it, it would uh, be counterproductive to the, to the larger effort. Now, the final thing I'd, uh, I'd, I'd say, and as I, Norman suggested, our testimony contains more specific suggestions for the Joint Committee. Uh, uh, we are trying to marshal some outside resources to try to lend a hand uh, to this process of congressional reform. Uh, Brookings and AEI have, uh, have come together uh, with the support of a number of foundations and we are holding conferences and off-the-record roundtables with members and staff and commissioning papers from scholarly experts and doing everything we can to try to help think through what's wrong and what to do about it because we don't think the answers are, are, are self-evident. We think there's a great deal of confusion. We see bits and pieces but we don't see how the whole comes together yet and we think this kind of deliberate effort outside the institution can support the effort that is launched uh, inside. We're going to be working hard over the next uh, the next months, uh, we, we will have a report for the Joint Committee sometime early next year. We also think it's uh, conceivable that the party caucuses will want to take some interim steps uh, uh, at the outset and, uh, and they may well uh, do so. I mean, there are going to be a lot of freshmen here looking to do something right away. We think it's important to have a reform initiative in place, the, the Joint Committee. Um, we also think it's worthwhile for each of the parties to be thinking in terms of their own caucuses and what steps might be taking in the short term. I also want to say that we are not the only group on the outside that's working in this way. You'll, um, you'll be hearing from others who are, uh, who are engaged in, in uh, comparable uh, uh, activities. There's a lot of interest outside the institution of trying to help Congress uh, improve itself to uh, reestablish uh, trust and legitimacy uh, in, the, in the political community and eventually in the broader public. We don't think you are the source of the major problems confronting the country, but you, that is Congress, like every other institution, is going to have to adapt uh, to changing circumstances, and we're happy to lend our, our full support uh, on that behalf. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I had to go down for a minute and vote. I missed uh, <clears throat> some of the testimony. Uh, Mr. Solomon. Uh, <clears throat> I apologize for having to run down and vote, too, as we were going here. Uh, you know, something you just said, uh, Dr. Mann and uh, Norm both, uh, is that uh, your outside efforts are just absolutely invaluable to us because sometimes I guess uh, being one of the 535 members of Congress, sometimes you're, you're really too close to really see the problem. And you get so tied up and, uh, uh, in the uh, interplay that uh, you really don't know what the problems are. And uh, so uh, that's why I'm so excited about, about your uh, eventual report uh, of, of letting us know what you think uh, the answers are. And they are not self-evident. Uh, and it has been 20 years since there was any kind of, uh, of change at all, and uh, other than the proliferation, which is not change, uh, in my opinion. 
Uh, one thing you said, uh, I think it was on page three or four, was that uh, you think strengthening the parties in Congress uh, while lessening partisan conflicts, uh, is that contradictory? I mean, how do you do that? I mean, that's, uh, and I, I'm trying to get the, the reasoning behind your point. I, uh, yeah. I don't think it's contradictory necessarily. In fact, I think part of the problem that we've had here, there, there are many reasons for the increased partisan tensions that we have here in the House, and we all know uh, that they're here. There's been a Very corrosion good. in trust uh, between uh, uh, the parties here. Part of it has to do with simply having 12 consecutive years of uh, divided government. Uh, it's that lengthy, continuous time uh, that, that makes a difference. But I think part of it also has to do with basically the weakness of central leadership within the parties. That it's not clear who can make a deal and make it work anymore. It's too easy for freelancers on the outside to throw grenades and disrupt the entire process. Uh, and once that begins, it gets into a, uh, a, a very bad and, and uh, what we've seen an inexorable downward spiral. I've likened this sometimes to uh, the movie in the book, The War of the Roses, where two partners in a process begin to uh, fall, have a falling out, and it just gets worse and worse until they become <coughs> single-minded in their desire to, uh, to get at the other. I think strengthening the bonds uh, that come through the parties and leadership here uh, may sound paradoxical, uh, but that's clearly a direction to bring more coherence to the process uh, that, that we've got to uh, seriously consider. Uh, I would add one other thing that relates to something that Tom said. Uh, as we go through the process of reform itself, we have got to bend over backwards, all of us, outside and inside, to make sure that this doesn't get caught up in the same spiral of distrust and grenade throwing between the parties. Last night, uh, as part of our effort, Tom and I had a, uh, a lengthy and uh, frank uh, off-the-record meeting with a number of the more thoughtful members of this body from both parties. And we found that in that setting, we could get people of good faith from both parties together to talk very frankly about the differences and distrust between the parties and begin to move towards something that strengthens the institution. We're going to have a hundred and some new members, who knows how many, 100, 120, 130 or more coming in. And as one of our uh, uh, lawmakers there last night said, having just been through an exercise of looking at the campaign literature of a large number of candidates from both parties, their agenda is change, but mindless change. They simply, at this point, almost uniformly have no idea of anything constructive to do, and that also could get caught up in this fashion. So we've got to make sure that we have something constructive that is institution building and builds for the society and not get into a picture where the kind of change we want is to rip the other party apart or to tear the institution down. <coughs> Solomon, I, I agree. A, a stronger and more confident majority party uh, will will be more generous to a minority party, especially a minority party that is itself stronger as a, uh, as a party and whose leaders uh, uh, have the confidence of, uh, of their rank and file. It sounds contradictory, but I think the best way to ease partisan tensions is in some way to strengthen uh, central authority within each of the parties. I tend to agree with you, and I just wanted to, I wanted to hear you say that. You know, uh, the one thing that uh, concerns me, and, and you mentioned on uh, page eight uh, in your joint AEI Brookings project on renewing Congress, uh, will include an interim report prior to the organization, uh, organizi organizing caucuses for the 103rd Congress. And uh, do you think it would be useful to those caucuses if the joint committee could also make an interim report this year? And I, the reason I say that, uh, we were involved in a, um, in a joint leadership uh, task force to deal with these ministerial changes, which were, were significant. Uh, and at the time, uh, there was some reluctance on the part of some of the leaders, uh, perhaps on both sides of the aisle, uh, to make interim changes now because they were worrying about this influx of 120 new members that you just mentioned and that something would have to be done to, I hate to use this term, but to pacify them. And what I worry about is that uh, after the election takes place, 
that regardless of what this committee comes up with, that uh, it will end up the same way that it did back in 1980, when, when our task force at that time, headed by Congressman Jerry Patterson from California, came up with uh, very significant recommendations. Um, everybody on the committee on both sides of the aisle agreed. We took that bill to the floor, and out of 435 members, we got 42 votes. It went down in flames because it made the kind of changes that uh, probably are necessary. And I just worry about that happening. And that's why, as my friend Tony Bielenson mentioned earlier, that uh, uh, I'm hopeful that that this task force, based on maybe recommendations from you and other uh, organizations, will be able to make some of these changes prior to the new sitting of that 103rd Congress, uh, simply because I'm afraid it won't happen. And there are many things that we all know and that you know, uh, even though a lot of them are not self-evident, uh, that we could do right now uh, in order to, to get this House functioning better than it is. And I'd just be interested in your comment on that. Uh, I'll offer a few comments on it, and I'm sure Tom will too. Uh, I, there's no question that we have to be very cognizant of uh, new people coming in and uh, having something that they can grab onto. And indeed, it would be nice if we had some ideas for people out on the campaign trail, uh, some of these candidates are very well-meaning and they just don't know at this point what ought to be done. But we are both very sensitive, all of us I think are very sensitive to the delicate relationships between the parties right now and the need gradually to build some level of trust. I want to be very careful that we don't do something in, a, in the pressure of a presidential election year that causes a breach of trust that makes it irreparable and makes it difficult to build in a constructive way while also responding to those needs. What, what I guess I would favor is giving this joint committee the authority to issue interim reports at its discretion. L leave it to the leaders and the, the likely members we're going to have in this committee, I think we know, are almost all going to be people in whom we can have some degree of trust to decide what ought to be done either before the election or before uh, the new Congress convenes uh, and some things uh, ought to be in, in, in their purview and recognizing as well that there are some things that are going to be more within the purview of the party caucuses. Much of the change exactly. we've seen in the past has come through the parties. We want to address that directly even as we address the Joint Committee. Some things may, ha may uh, be done by one and then reinforced by the other. I'd leave some discretion for the Joint Committee, but I wouldn't want to force or mandate action yeah. that could uh, muck up the works. Mm. Which was my whole idea, was to be able to present it to the, the caucus, uh, to the Republican and Democratic caucus in December after the election. Uh, but I think there really is a division of labor between the Joint Committee and the party caucuses. Uh, and to try to use the Joint Committee process to, to dictate uh, uh, reforms to the caucuses will, I think, end up having the effect of heightening partisan tensions and undermining the whole effort. I mean, my worry is that if you require an interim r report, in a sense, it sends a signal there, there is an agenda. We know it's right. Uh, the, the, the problem is, uh, is figuring out a way to get it adopted. Uh, uh, I look at the House Republican agenda on reform and rules and, you know, I, I see some things that make a lot of sense to me and other things I have questions about. It's not self-evident. Um, it, it really needs to be developed together in a bipartisan fashion over time with no question about this becoming fodder for the partisan battles before the election. Uh, I think if such a requirement were there, it would, it would tend to undermine the standing of the Joint Committee within, uh, within the majority party. And that we are so anxious to have this thing move forward on a, on a basis in which both parties will lend it credibility and support that, that we fear that such a requirement would undermine that effort. I'm sure uh, you won't mind if we submit more questions to you, and uh, if so, I won't ask any more right now. Thank you. <clears throat> doing the right thing and, uh, and and I think that if, it, if it's possible for us to come up with uh, some plan that would be available 
as new members come in, that uh, we could uh, would guide them in, in both the co in both caucuses. I think we it, it would be very positive. Having served on the Patterson Committee and a number of other committees over the years, I will, quite frankly will tell you, if uh, and, and being part of the leadership when we came up with the just recent institutional changes as administrator and that sort of thing, uh, if we had the difficulty that uh, that we did in trying to reach some sort of conclusion there, uh, I don't uh, have a great deal of. Uh, uh, confidence uh, in what this committee may do, although I, I do have confidence in the effort, and I think the effort uh, should be made. I, I think the fact of the matter is that that we, we, we uh, this institution, a little over 200 years old, uh, was originally conceived by our founding fathers to represent a nation of a, a few million people of, uh, in an agrarian uh, situation. And I think there are a lot of changes that I could suggest that, that need to be made, but, uh, you know, we, we get into these turf battles and there's some question about the, whether they'll ever be made. I'll just throw out a few that I think uh, would be uh, interesting to consider, and I, if you care to comment on them. I think we ought to do away with the Ways and Means Committee. I think we ought to do away with the Appropriations Committee. I think we ought to do away with the Budget Committee. And I, uh, and I think that we uh, should combine all uh, of most of the uh, of that into one committee, call it a finance committee or what you want to do. And I think that uh, they should uh, write the budget, both from the uh, tax standpoint as well as the disbursement. And it ought to be put on the floor and have priority over anything else unless it was declared to be a national emergency. And that we uh, should deal with that. Uh, for whatever time it took, it would probably take a month or two, I'm sure. But uh, I think one of the problems is that, uh, as far as our finances are concerned, and I think one of the problems leading possibly to a large part of the budget deficit is the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing, and it's just uh, so disjointed. The 1974 Budget Act was supposed to bring all of that under one sort of umbrella, so to speak. Uh, but. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, it has not done that. Uh, the uh, my uh, colleague says he votes yes on my proposal. That means I, <laughs> that says to me I must uh, reconsider immediately. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think uh, uh, you know, I think uh, I, th I think another thing that I think would be uh, uh, worth considering would be to uh, allow members to have uh, one committee. And, uh, you know, all of us know that uh, most members cannot get to the meetings on the subcommittees and, and major committees and minor committees and one thing that they, uh, they serve on, and a lot of it is done through um, proxy voting and, and one thing and another. And, uh, you know, as someone has already pointed out here earlier, we dealt with a situation yesterday that I think is a perfect example of one of the major problems here in trying to put a rule together on the energy bill. Uh, we had, I don't know, 30 or 40 witnesses yesterday. Uh, uh, we uh, ended up with uh, major uh, committee confrontations and turf and and uh, and one thing and another. Then with uh, I've forgotten exactly how many amendments from uh, members, but I, it seems to me at least a hundred or so. <clears throat> and we were <clears throat> asked to bring all that into focus so the House could uh, do its will. And and we'll do it and do the very best we can. But that it's 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 a flaw in the system that it uh, should get there in nine different committees. Uh, in, in, involved. I think we go back to the, and, and I don't think there's any answer to what I'm getting ready to say, and I think the reason that, that, that we, if we don't function as well as, as we would like we have, but uh, there is no leadership because there can be no leadership. You know, back in the days of Sam Rabin and and, and before that, uh, we like to think there was substantial leadership uh, back then, but uh, the, the party leaders had some leverage uh, back then that they could exert. Uh, the committee chairman had leverage that they could exert uh, to bring members uh, along with uh, whatever they were trying to do. The, uh, the leaders, both the uh, minority and the majority, don't have that leverage anymore. We've all become 
uh, to a large degree because of PACs uh, uh, and uh, modern communications and one thing and another, we've all become independent contractors and uh, it can get elected whether our uh, party leaderships, uh, ship likes it uh, or not. And I don't know how you get around that, but as I said, I go back to the 1974 reforms that were started, as you certainly rightly pointed out, along a, a good bit before I arrived there. And we actually, uh, in 1974, gave the additional votes that were necessary to, to go through on some of the, these reforms. And uh, as I look back on it, I'm not sure this place runs better because of some of the things we did. The disbursement, of course, when you're a freshman, uh, the seniority system doesn't appeal to you. As you uh, move on and you're here a little longer, it begins to appeal to you a little more. And we were all freshmen, and uh, we thought uh, that the large part of the ills of this body at the time were because of those who had been there uh, much longer than we have, and they just didn't understand the situation like we did. But I think because of some of the things that we did, and we were interested in getting into that power structure and having our say, we accomplished that, but I'm not sure in the long run that we serve this institution uh, well. Uh, but those are some of my thoughts, and there aren't any questions there, but if either one of you care to comment, I'd be delighted to have you. I guess I'll have to go apologize to Mr. Rostenkowski immediately when I leave here for suggesting. And Mr. Witt. Uh, and Mr. Witt. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and Mr. Panetta, yes, and others. Uh, I, I don't think you'll have any trouble getting votes in this room for that proposal, but outside <laughs> might be a little more difficult. Well, I... Uh, <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd uh, I guess, make a couple of uh, general points. Uh, clearly, part of the difficulty of figuring out what to do with Congress is that we have to strike balances between uh, uh, conflicting desirable things. In a broader sense, uh, obviously, we have to strike a balance between efficiency and making things happen and representation, uh, which is uh, one of the prime goals of Congress. And somehow striking that balance, which includes figuring out where you centralize and where you don't, uh, is not an easy one. And we, uh, it's not that we go back and forth necessarily, but we've tinkered with it a lot over time, and, and uh, it constantly needs some adjustments. We need some real adjustments from the kind of tinkering that we did uh, in the 70s, and we have to think that through, uh, which I suspect, from our perspective, is going to involve more centralization of authority. Now, another balance we have to strike is between that centralization of authority and leadership on the one hand, but also harnessing and utilizing the talents and the interests and the energy levels of the mass of rank and file members here. You know, part of the reason that we had something that seemed to work more smoothly in the 40s and 50s, frankly, is that we had an awful lot of rank and file members who were basically cannon fodder. They didn't come here with uh, a lot of the kinds of talents that we find with members today. It's one of the great ironies that people are more vilified today, and yet the quality by almost any standard of an objective observer is that much greater. But because they didn't have those interests, you could have a few people who did having much more of a leadership role. Now that we have those interests and talents, we have to figure out some way that we can utilize them to the nation's good without having it bollocks up the works. There's one other point I think that needs to be made in terms of the leadership. There is no question that we had uh, more of an exercise of leadership in general by many people, including party leaders, uh, some years ago. But ironically, the changes of the uh, uh, early 1970s not only decentralized authority, they also gave more formal powers to the speaker and to other leaders. If you look at the formal powers that Carl Albert had when he became speaker and compare them with the formal powers that Sam Rayburn had had when he left, Albert had many more. Nobody would make the case that Albert was a more assertive leader than Rayburn. And it leads us, obviously, as we go through this, to have to be a little bit cautious, simply structurally changing things. Giving somebody or some institution more power doesn't mean they will necessarily assert that power. It doesn't mean that the dy dynamic will work in that fashion. The architects of reforms in the late 60s and early 70s had as their goal decentralizing authority away from committee chairman, but also centralizing it to some degree into party leadership. They took, for the majority party, control over committee assignments away from Ways and Means Democrats to give it to party leaders. The decentralization clearly meant more in the end than the centralization, and we've got to sort through some of that. One quick comment on the fiscal policy issue. Uh, 
I, I start believing what uh, Rudy Penner, the uh, former uh, head of the Congressional Budget Office, said uh, some years ago, that as a basic principle, the process isn't the problem, the problem is the problem. And we are not, whether it's through a constitutional amendment or abolishing a bunch of committees, going to reduce our, uh, or eliminate our deficits. But it's quite clear as well that we need some attention paid to the fiscal policy process. Tony Bielenson gave it several years of attention before. Mm -hmm. There are ideas out there. My judgment personally is that we have at least one layer too many and we need to figure out how we can consolidate those layers and bring more coherence early on in that process and somehow also bring a little bit more truth in the debate over uh, the budget deficit mm -hmm. uh, where people realize from the start what the components of the budget are and that this is not something that can easily be resolved with a uh, signing of a, uh, with a pen of a constitutional amendment or, as a presidential candidate has suggested, without breaking a sweat by uh, simply eliminating waste, fraud, and abuse and improved well, tax collection. We need to do something there, and maybe structural changes can move us know, at least a bit in that direction. You and I, we certainly understand Congress uh, will not do will it, what it will not do, and uh, regardless of, of what the procedural process is, and, you know, I've been here long enough we were going to balance the budget with the Budget Act back in 1974. We were going to do it again in 81 with Graham Latta. Uh, and we were going to do it again with Graham Rudman's Hollings. And uh, I suppose, again, we're going to do it with the balanced budget amendment that we're about to, uh, to take up. And, of course, Congress is uh, always looking for some mechanism that might do the things that they don't want to have to deal with and and they found and will continue to find consistently that that is, that is not the case and I, I certainly appreciate that. I do think that there are some things procedurally that may, might might get the attention of members a little more and might might allow them to to uh, deal with these problems more in depth and not be spread out quite as uh, as thin as some members are. But you know, I think we also have to remember too that I mean, you know, this is a nation of what, 250 or 60 million people now and with the diverse interest in, in one thing and it's not an easy job uh, to run. Anyway, did you... Uh, I'd, I'd simply add, Mr. Derek, it's just important not to overpromise with these efforts. The, the point of reforming our budget process, changing the responsibilities of the committee, is, is not to eliminate the budget deficit. It's, it's to help Congress deal with these matters better, more responsibly, more effectively. Uh, if you don't overpromise, uh, uh, if you don't promise them a rose garden, if you if you simply say we're looking for changes, some marginal, some more substantial, that would uh, allow this institution, its members, to better go about their work, over promise. Uh, uh, if you don't promise them a rose garden, if you if you simply say we're looking for changes, some marginal, some more substantial, that would uh, allow this institution, its members, to better go about their work. That would be accomplishment enough. What do you think of my suggestion that we uh, form that one committee and do away with the three? Uh, uh, I, I don't think a whole lot of uh, that. In fact, I'd, I'd suggest the, the odds of Congress abolishing the Ways and Means and Appropriations Committee to, are, uh, are slim. Uh, but what I do think is there may be an extra layer there in that whole process. Uh, I mean, you think, think we, of it you as think we should, Do you think that we should uh, a budget the, uh, abolish the budget committee? Uh, do you I, think it has ceased to form a, a worthwhile function? I think the process as it, as it now exists is, uh, uh, is not constructive and helpful to members or the institution. Is that and a yes or a no? Uh, the, I'm, not pre I'm prepared to reform it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if the way to do it is to simply abolish it, but I'm prepared to restructure it in some fairly substantial way. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Bielenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> this has been extremely interesting already in the first hour. I mean, in all seriousness, we've had lots of very thoughtful comments from members and, and from you all, and we're, I'm sure we'll get a lot more uh, later on. One of the interesting suggestions, in my opinion, has been the one by our friend from South Carolina about setting up a single committee. I'm sure you're right, Tom. I suppose it's not possible for us to do that, but in fact, that's exactly what we the situation we had in, in the state legislature in Sacramento, perhaps in South Carolina as well. 
Uh, I remember well, I was chairman of that committee, had a lot of authority, power at the time, but we had one basic budget committee. It was called the Senate Finance Committee. It included all the elements and the jurisdiction of what you find in both the appropriations and the ways and means and the budget committees here. And we were responsible for the overall budget. I was the author each year of the, of the governor's budget bill. We presented it on the floor for a number of days and debated it. And we had a coherent, uh, thoughtful discussion of that. And although it's a, it's a radical suggestion in the sense that it's going to step on an awful lot of toes, I think it's a very useful one, uh, and, and one which uh, I hope will be presented by you and perhaps by me and others uh, to, to this committee, which I hope will, will set up in the, in the uh, near future. Something of that sort. I mean, it, uh, it would solve a lot of the problems immediately. The only problem it doesn't solve is how to get there, how to get the votes to, to make that particular um, change. I, I go back again to something which I think Tom Mann said at the outset, and that was that it's, it's, it's obvious to all of us that we need reform, we need to make some changes, but it's not at all that clear, and that's why we've got to take some little time, or at least this commission, once it's set up, this committee, joint committee has to, to, to figure out what needs to be done, um, what the, exactly the problems are. That, that is not entirely self-evident. I went quickly through your, the, the, what the two of you have in your prepared testimony, as Jerry Solomon was re referring to it earlier, too, and you picked eight or nine or ten areas. The first is the most obvious, in my opinion, and also the most difficult about assessing the form and extent of the mismatch between the long-term problems confronting the, the country and the jurisdictions of congressional committees and subcommittees and their staff resources. resources. That, I guess, is what the, the old Patterson Committee foundered on when you come back and suggest that you do away, or uh, what Mr. Derrick's good idea is going to founder on, I suppose. Unfortunately, that when you suggest you do away with certain committees, certain jurisdictions, you run into all kinds of internal opposition from people who would lose that, that jurisdiction. Uh, but there may be some other things. Let me suggest one, and I say this in a, if, if, I hope my, my colleagues will forgive me, I say it in a very non, non judgmental way, because I mean it that way, but one of the big problems, which I don't think you mentioned at all, is the fact that uh, the legislative body is awash in special interest money. Uh, and I think, for, for example, that uh, congressional campaign reform has got to be a major, a major part of an answer to make, uh, to, if you want to end up with a more responsive and more representative, uh, more democratic, with small d, uh, Congress. One final, one, one question, I've just been talking, but w one question, if I may, has to do with, with the, the study that you all and your two fine institutions are involved in. Uh, and I know something from, from reading quickly through your testimony, what your timetable is, but will you in any way, assuming we take at least for portions of this, or our committee that we tend to set up, set, takes at least for portions of this study and its, and its uh, eventual reported results a year and a half or so, will you have done some at least useful preliminary work early enough on that we can take some advantage of it? Because quite obviously you don't want to be out there working all by yourself and not being able to contribute to us. Quite clearly we'd love to be able to, well, I'm speaking for the members who are going to be appointed, but I hope they feel the same way, take advantage of, of your very thoughtful analysis of what the problems are and what some of the solutions might be. Would you be would you, I think you were talking about a, an interim report early next year. Let's, uh, let's for, for just for purposes of argument, and assuming that Mr. Solomon is right, which I believe he is, and as you all yourselves have suggested, that it would be useful for us to have at least a package of some, if, even if it's just modest, suggested reforms ready for the new class of 100 and odd people next year. Would you be in a position to be able to be of help to our people and our, on our joint committee uh, sometime before the end of the year with respect to some of your early suggestions, perhaps? Uh, Yes. Uh, we've talked about an interim report shortly after the elections and then uh, our full report to the Joint Committee er early next year so that we, we keenly appreciate the need to uh, uh, channel the energies of the new freshman class uh, immediately after the election as they come to Washington. I mean, part of it is to get them to buy into the Joint Committee and its longer term work, but Part of it will be to allow them to participate in various activities in their party caucuses where rules changes and other activities might be proposed. And we have every intention of, of, of trying to reach some conclusions, especially with respect to party-based uh, changes uh, in sufficient time that uh, they can be utilized uh, in those party caucuses. The other thing, uh, Tony, that I'd say is that our, our intention, hope, is to 
is to is to be in touch with this joint committee uh, from the outset yeah, I was and to share with that. them and the staff the fruits of our work and, and our own thoughts. We could probably save some money on staffing if we could take advantage of you and your foundation support. One final statement question, if I may, Mr. Chairman, forgive me for taking so long. Um, this is, as I said, just to begin with a statement, but I hope that you, that you folks will concentrate on what you think really ought to be done and not worry overly, not that you shouldn't quite obviously, and since you're, you're learned observers of this process and, and know as well as we in many cases what, what, what the possibilities are, don't worry, I would hope that you don't worry overly about exactly what's politically possible to do. Um, this was a good idea, for example, for my brother Derek. It may not be possible to do, but if it's something, or other things, I mean, I'm just using that as one example, obviously, which you think ought to be done, I'm hopeful that you all will suggest that. It may just be that we'll find the will, and with a lot of new folks around, a lot of new faces around here who don't have, uh, you know, don't already have some jurisdiction or some turf to, to defend or to hang on to, we may simply, we may in fact be able to do some things which would not ordinarily be, be able to be done. So I hope that your suggestions, that, that, that you, that you, your suggestions uh, are for things which your thoughts have, have and, your, and your study has led you to believe ought to be done and, and not uh, temper it too terribly much with respect to the political realities as you see them, of course. Just, just let me add just one thing that I ask you to, to think about as you, as you look at these things. You know my observation. I'm, of the 74 class and what we did. I think uh, six months or a year later, we would not have done those things. Because, and I think you have to hit it right on the edge before personal alliances and, and, and you know, you can vote somebody out, but if you get to know them as a human being, it's, 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 it's more difficult and you can make a more objective decision. I, I think just to keep that in mind. We are very cognizant of uh, what's going to happen here, having both been right at the center of things when 74 occurred, uh, what's going to happen with all these new members coming in, and the need, the need to channel and harness their uh, feeling of mandate for change, and not to let it get away from all of us and turn into something destructive. Uh, what I think we haven't worked out yet, Tony, whether we're going to uh, uh, come up with a specific blueprint of change. I don't think we will, uh, uh, but much more a uh, a list of ideas and recommendations mixed together. There'll be some things I think that we will feel strongly are at the core of what ought to be done, but there may be others where we will raise ideas and issues and talk about the pros and cons, the likely uh, unintended consequences uh, that will, I hope, stretch the minds of the members of the committee and stretch, uh, stretch uh, the minds of Congress. I make one point about the, the notion of looking at the, at the uh, problems and the uh, uh, ways in which we deal with them. Now, obviously, the toughest thing to do around here is to alter committee jurisdictions or deal with committees because it's so central to, to uh, members. And yet it's obviously essential in one form or another. It may not be essential, though, to uh, look at the way in which we deal with problems simply by permanently altering structures. We want to explore other options. Uh, one of the things we've begun to talk about a great deal is the ad hoc committee authority that exists around here. There can be some problem areas central enough for the country and important enough to be dealt with quickly where you can pull together a more representative group to deal with it uh, without having to forcibly uh, remove the jurisdiction from the Commerce Committee or the Ways and Means Committee or uh, the Interior Committee or, or other places. As we did with energy 15 years ago. We did it with energy. We, uh, we tried it with welfare reform, but it hasn't been used very much. And it may be that we can find a better way to channel those energies without having to uh, completely uh, Maybe we should have no standing committees and the speaker each year should put bunches of folks together to work on particular problems. One of the things we want to do is to, you, you talked Probably about the California, the California legislature. Clearly there are ideas or there are ways in which state legislatures operate that uh, can give us some useful uh, and imaginative uh, fodder for considering what ought to be done in Congress and we intend to do that very explicitly. Anyway, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, just end, ending up, we thank you very much for your testimony, and I must say, at least from this member, and I'm sure it's true of others too, that it's, it's very comforting and helpful to all of us to know that you all are out there working in tandem, in a sense, or parallel with some of the efforts that are going to be made here, and that we can call on your, you for help because uh, you are very learned observers of what goes on here, and you're able to be, I think, a little bit more objective, perhaps, about some of these things than we ourselves are, yet you do understand our problems, which it makes us, you know, 
consider you very useful and helpful friends. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, both for your uh, very important efforts. Let me begin by uh, saying to Norm that if we have a fraction of the success dealing with reform here that we have in rebuilding our initial rebuilding efforts in South Central Los Angeles, we will be uh, doing extraordinarily well because things are, are uh, really uh, improving dramatically out there, I should say. Let me also say to Tom that uh, I, I very much hope that we can move from this uh, corrosive cynicism to healthy skepticism once again. And I believe that if we're able to do that, we clearly will be improving this place. Uh, you know, we keep hearing about this 1974 class. Mr. McEwen and I came in in the 1980 class, which saw 33 incumbent members of the, uh, on the Democratic side defeated. And we like to think that we were able to bring about a few changes then, but obviously not a lot. I should say that as we look towards January of 1993, uh, from our perspective, the greatest prospect to implement the kinds of reforms that I suspect you will propose late this fall and in January uh, would be if we were to see a change in the leadership in this place. And uh, because we clearly do have a package that has been put forward. I'd like to first ask of you, Tom, you said there's some things in the Republican package which make sense and some which uh, you don't, uh, are, don't support. And I wondered if you could outline a few of those for us. Actually, I don't feel able to do that. I don't have them in front of me, and I haven't done a serious uh, analysis such that, that I'd like to go on record now reacting to them. I, I think I said that in the, in the context of there being an explicit agenda uh, that the minority party in the House has with respect to reform, and it inevitably uh, elicits a partisan response from the majority party mm -hmm. if proposed en masse. Uh, and I thought that it was pr prudent to begin this process in as bipartisan a fashion as possible to, to in effect, not not sell the sell the package or push the package down the other party's throat, but to convince them that it's the right thing to do. And you do that the old-fashioned way, uh, uh, piece by piece, making the argument for it, pointing out the problems, and and uh, and uh, selling the solution. So that that was really the the gist of my uh, response to Mr. Solomon. As we look at some of the specific proposals um, which which have come forward, uh, uh, you Tom have responded to Butler's comment about the uh, about the issue of one finance committee for the House. Uh, how do you respond to? Uh, they're not going to do that until one o'clock. They said. Um, the, the 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 question of uh, one committee per member. I mean, before I joined this committee, I was on about a half a dozen subcommittees, and it was very difficult to, uh, as as Butler said earlier, participate in all of this work. And I know that that. There are many members who sit on standing committees today who would not like to give them up, but if we do in fact have 150 new members and they, uh, as, as my colleague Vin Weber said, they will be elected on the platform of change and reform, uh, maybe the idea of one committee per member, or as Tony has just said, uh, maybe having the speaker establish standing committees to take on the uh, crises that we face, the challenges that we face, might be a, a good way for us to go. How do you respond to the one committee idea? One of the problems now is that a member's career can be ruined with a lousy uh, committee assignment. If, if they're put on a committee that just doesn't have very interesting work and they're stuck with it and, uh, and can't move, it's a frustration. So one of the ways they've dealt with that is You're referring to the to Rules Committee? Or? <laughs> <laughs> is to get appointed to sort of other committees on a on a sort of part-time basis or a select or a special committee. Maybe what we ought to be investigating here is more rotation on, uh, on committees. Uh, it isn't obvious to me that careers are built only by service on a, on a single committee. There, there is precedent in state legislatures and in other legislative bodies to, to have more rotation. And there is, of course, the experience with uh, 
with several committees in which, uh, in which tenure on that committee is limited by, uh, by congressional rule, like the Intelligence Committee and the, mm -hmm. and the Budget Committees. I, I, I do think uh, people's attention and energy is, is divided. Uh, there, are, there are too many things to be done. The schedule of most members of Congress is absolutely frenetic. Um, and so something ought to be done about that. On the other hand, as Norman suggested earlier, it's extremely important to constructively engage the energies and intelligence of, of members of Congress. Uh, you want to figure out a way to take advantage of your, mm -hmm. your energies, but to do it in a fashion that we produce a collective outcome that is, uh, that is constructive. Well, I would argue that if we had more open rules on the House floor, members would have a greater opportunity to participate in the legislative process in committees which they, on which they don't serve. What, after having gone through the package uh, that we did yesterday, again, everyone has decried hours and hours of hearings in this room yesterday and 164 proposed amendments and all. Uh, what is your response to uh, the, the goal of trying to bring an end to this question of joint referral. It was, uh, I was somewhat tongue in cheek yesterday saying to Chairman Dingell when he was complaining uh, that George Miller and the Interior Committee had taken on some of their responsibility. It is amazing for all of us to observe how uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee has uh, been able to successfully uh, have jurisdiction over so many disparate areas. And I, I wonder if, if uh, an end to this question of joint referral would be uh, uh, one of the recommendations that you all might consider. Norm? Uh, we're going to have to look uh, very carefully at uh, how we strike a balance here, too. It's part of the discussion of, joint, of uh, ad hoc committees. I'm not sure that ending joint referral is going to solve the problem. In fact, uh, I'm more inclined to try and strengthen the, the role of leadership in making sure that you don't get into these uh, destructive uh, turf wars where things get bottled up in one committee, uh, that somehow you can find ways to get things out uh, and to get them moving along uh, with a stronger use of, uh, of uh, uh, joint referral authority mm -hmm. with a stronger hand by leadership. That's probably a better way in which to go. It's going to be very tough when you have issue areas that clearly do transcend a single committee uh, in, in uh, different ways. To arbitrarily pick one committee and not another, it's going to be very difficult when you have chairmen and members who are extremely assertive and imaginative to keep them from figuring out ways of getting into something. It's much better to strike that balance, I think, by giving leaders more authority to be able to uh, put coherent packages Tom together. said he didn't like the idea of one finance committee eliminating appropriations budget in ways and means. Do you all support the concept of reducing the number of committees in the House? I think, yeah, I think the number of committees can, can be reduced. The number of subcommittees is something... Since we have made uh, recommendations from this committee, ways and means appropriations and budget to be eliminated, would you all like to propose some committees which we might eliminate? I'm not ready to do that yet either, David. Uh, I, I, I've been through this exercise uh, in both the House and the Senate side before, um, particularly on the Senate side. And you got to strike. It's a difficult balance to strike, frankly. There may be some committees you want to create, even as you eliminate others, find some underbrush uh, that you can reduce and consolidate. But getting back to what Tom said as well, I want to find a way in which we don't have members feeling so fragmented in their lives that they can't spend any time thinking or concentrating on issues, and also where we have an institution that really never debates big issues. When we get to the floor now, we don't debate big issues. We debate narrow <coughs> points or technical grounds or something that, that doesn't relate to the real needs of the country. We need to find a way to do that. I proposed both here uh, when we discussed the uh, question period and in, uh, an, an article in Roll Call that we figure out a way to use the floor to have grand debates in the House. Mm -hmm. I think it would be good for the institution and good for the country. I'd like to do that. I'd like to find a way that we can constructively engage the members without having them feel that they're too fragmented. Simply limiting people to one committee may not do that because, as Tom suggested, as long as you have committees that have widely different responsibilities, some people will always get the short end of the stick. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not sure I want to do that. It, I'm not sure either that simply equalizing the committees, if we can find some way to do that, is necessarily the best way to go. Mm -hmm. I'd like to consolidate a little bit. I'd like to bring more central authority, not necessarily reducing or uh, eliminating large numbers of subcommittees, because I think oftentimes 
you will better and more constructively engage members if they have some responsibility of their own than if you take away that responsibility and they'll find other places that may be less constructive to do it without having it simply branch off into uh, a, a form of, uh, of creative anarchy. I, I'd rather focus on the number of subcommittee assignments, perhaps, which is one of the things that we did on the Senate side, and find a way to, uh, to uh, uh, create a balance there. You've got 435 people here, the vast majority of whom are able and who come here not because they want a sinecure where they can sit around and take orders from somebody or simply uh, revel in uh, the supposed perks that make this institution. We know we've got 435 people who come here to work their tails off to make a better country by and large. There are very few exceptions to that. We've got to find a way to channel those energies and to give them useful uh, and constructive and responsible things to do while also having a coherent program or set of issues that we can engage in the Congress. The answers are not quite so simple. You know, you talk, Norm, about the importance of this subcommittee level work and members should, should be uh, involved and able to participate there. And I hearken back to what I said earlier and what is sort of the one note that we constantly play from this side of the aisle. And that is that uh, more open rules would, in fact, provide members with an opportunity to participate. I mean, if we, if we did say have a, have a change in the scheduling process around here, because the, the main reason stated for um, restrictive rules is that, gosh, we could be stuck on this bill for a month if we have an open rule. Uh, people are always saying, if we're going to get out of here by 5 o'clock Thursday night so that we can all catch our planes to be back uh, in our districts, uh, we, we have little choice other than to restrict the number of amendments. So it seemed to me that, that while we have Congress come in, convene at uh, 11 o'clock noon, 2 o'clock on Wednesdays, so that the committee process can work, maybe if we did reduce some of the committee load and in fact had more open rules and say convened at 9 o'clock, on a regular basis and uh, allowed members who might otherwise not be able to participate in what Tom refers to as that ideal committee which can promote their career, a chance to work on the House floor uh, as frankly we're able to in this Rules Committee because as you know we address virtually every single uh, issue, every major piece of legislation comes before us here and I wondered how you'd respond to that thought. Mr. Dreyer, the, uh, in, in a sense, you're talking about Norm the calls me David. You can too, Tom. <laughs> okay, David. Uh, you're, you're talking, in a sense, about the House in the late 70s. Uh, there was an extraordinary increase in the number of amendments offered on the floor of, of the House in this period as, as the, the whole process opened up became much much more permeable, open to influence by amendment of members, people sitting off uh, the committees. And both parties had a real hard time with it. Uh, it was chaotic, it was unpredictable. Uh, the House looked silly at times, it went on at length, and there were keen feelings in the Republican as well as uh, Democratic Party leaderships that we had to bring some more predictability and order to this process, that we had to figure out what the big issues and divisions were and make sure those get surfaced. Now, the complaint has been that in recent years, we're not even getting to those big issues, that at times on the crucial, the crucial debates don't take place because of a set of procedures and practices that have followed. I'm sympathetic to that, to that critique, and we will certainly be working hard in our project to figure out ways of, of, of getting debates on major questions of public policy, but I, for one, do not want to see the House return to the day when it looked more like the Senate than the House, mm -hmm. uh, in which it was every individual, man and woman, for himself or herself on the floor. It was unpredictable, it was chaotic, and it was not good public policy mm -hmm. uh, making. The fact is we need a division of labor between committees and the floor. The House is strong because it has a division of labor. You don't want to weaken committees, you want to figure out how to strengthen them, but then to have the appropriate balance between the floor and those committees. Let Tom, me, can I, let me just uh, offer an additional, additional word or two on this. I, I want to be very frank uh, about where I think our problems reside, and I, I, I agree in, entirely with Tom. Uh, I am very sympathetic to the frustration that minority members feel now that they're not getting a chance in many cases on the floor to offer their legitimate alternatives and to have a debate on the big alternatives. Uh, I think there's an awful lot of truth to that, but I think there are many reasons for it. 
A part of it has to do, a good part of it, with the erosion of trust between the parties. Mm -hmm. Democrats feel, and they, and they have some very good reasons to feel that way, that oftentimes amendments that are offered are offered for reasons of trying to embarrass them or uh, uh, fry them, as one uh, member said to me, on the floor. Things that are not the sort of broad alternatives in good faith. And so we've gotten into a situation where uh, whenever that happens, there's this kind of rage and we'll get back at you guys or we're going to restrict what happens on the floor. If we can strengthen party leadership so that we know that when we debate large issues and we have uh, amendments on the floor that in fact what we're going to get are really good faith amendments on both sides or alternatives, I think we will have an opportunity here to open things up a, a, a little bit more and open them up a little bit more. Open rules per se I think would not be a good direction in which to move in a general sense. First of all there are lots of policy issues that all of us know about that would pass unanimously on the floor that would not be good public <coughs> policy. There are good reasons to have ways to keep some things from ever getting there. Uh, I'll mention one because I'm not a member and I don't have to deal with it. It's called Notch Babies. And n none of you have to respond to that. But I'd just as soon have uh, a, a situation where many things that are wildly popular but that would not be good public policy, you can use your own examples, are not allowed on the floor. Modify rules, allow uh, uh, for uh, alternatives, but also have real debates so that some of what we can get out on the floor is in fact minority alternatives expressed in the context of a grand debate about what Republicans would do about energy, what Republicans would do to rebuild the cities, and then have Democrats talk about what they would do. You don't have to do it necessarily in the context of a specific bill either. Well, Norm, you, you, you make an argument which seems to be contradictory. How, how does strengthening the party leadership bring about an end to partisan conflict? I don't want an end to partisan conflict. That's part or at of the, least less part of. Uh, I, I want it channeled in a constructive direction rather than a corrosive and, and destructive direction. Mm -hmm. If you have stronger party leadership, you can begin to rebuild. I believe the sense of confidence on both sides that they will make arrangements in good faith that the rank and file members on both sides then will respond to and that you can channel things in a constructive way. I'm afraid that what happens now is that nobody believes that any deal can be struck with either side that uh, where there's any confidence that it'll be kept. And there is a sense on both sides that there are lots of people uh, across the divide there who have as their major interest shafting uh, our guys. Mm -hmm. Until you can get some sense where you can channel the partisan divisions in a way that we really join debate constructively, and I think that means having leaders who have more authority, we're going to have real problems. I, I, uh, I know that you all are in the process of working on your package, and I feel as if I'd have, I've had a rather difficult time getting specifics out of you, so I'm going to try to ask two final specific questions. First of all, do you support the concept of one joint House-Senate Intelligence Committee? Uh, I do not, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I believe that it has been very constructive for the intelligence community and for intelligence policy to have a large number of members of both houses serving for a period of time on that committee. I would change the, the House to make the period of rotation the, the same as the Senate. I think it has damaged the House committee to have a six-year rotation when the Senate has eight years. And I think uh, it, it's, uh, it would be better to have a longer period of rotation. But I honestly believe that you have an awful lot of people coming in here who knew nothing about intelligence across the ideological spectrum, who were willing to take all kinds of pot shots at the intelligence agencies and, and people there who, who thought that we had uh, a bunch of uh, individuals who were uh, interested uh, more in uh, daring do than in uh, the, the sorts of things that are necessary for our country, who have been socialized into understanding what an important and valuable thing this is for the uh, necessary thing for the country. And I like that idea. I would support a different kind of change, and that is creating a joint committee that is the equivalent of the Joint Committee on Taxation, where in fact what you have is a joint professional staff. Mm -hmm. I think a good part of the problem that people respond to when they call for a Joint Committee on Intelligence is that we've had a vast expansion of intelligence staff 
to individual members and on both sides where there's a sense that you can't. Well, you know, this sure was our real concern when we, when we established that October Surprise Committee, when we talked about the prospect of a Senate staffer on the October Surprise Committee flying to Paris to do an interview and a House staffer the same thing. So I think the idea of a joint staff is a The Joint Committee on move. Taxation has been, I think, almost, would almost universally be seen as one of the great successes in Congress. Mm -hmm. You had high quality people, professionalized, Becoming a member of that staff is seen as a real mark uh, in the society and in the community of uh, tax specialists. I think you could do the same thing with intelligence, but keep a large number of people who spend a little time learning about mm -hmm. this process, and you'll have a better house in my Doing judgment. Doing that on that, Tom? Uh, only to say that I've written on this subject very much along the lines that Norman has just outlined. Mm -hmm. uh, Let me get to my one last specific question, that is, as, as we begin to look at the establishment of this committee, what single item do each of you see as the most important reform that could be made to try and improve this place? I want to bring some coherence in the way in which we set an agenda for the nation and debate that agenda. Uh, I think right now we do it uh, in not quite a random but in a reactive uh, way and often let things pile up entirely to the end. We don't focus on what the important problems are that need to be dealt with and then focus on how we're going to deal with them well enough in this institution. Mm -hmm. Tom? My belief, uh, my belief is that the big problem of American government now is that uh, is that politicians and members of the public uh, refuse to talk honestly to one another, that we're caught up in a situation <coughs> in which uh, everyone is consumed with appearances and uh, not enough concern about realities and outcomes. And I'm looking for changes, and I don't have a single silver bullet to accomplish it, that would make it easier for this country's elected leaders to speak honestly and frankly to the people about the problems that confront the country and to feel as if they won't be uh, immediately punished as a, as a consequence. Well, I think that your uh, mere presence here will help to mitigate the corrosive cynicism and move us back towards healthy skepticism. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost. Uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I'm not going to take a great deal of time because um, these witnesses have been on for a long time now. Um, I would like, and you may have mentioned this very early in your testimony when I wasn't in the room, uh, would you both, uh, and let me ask you this one specific um, comment on the success or lack of success of what the United States Senate has attempted in having one week off each month, having three weeks where you're in session, where you go Monday to Friday, uh, and having one week where you're not in session at all, and uh, senators can go back and conduct whatever business they need to in their districts, and they have some certainty and some predictability. The answer is it hasn't been perfect, but I think it's worked uh, well enough. Uh, I now hear senators complaining less bitterly than they used to about the uh, total unpredictability of their schedules. It's still difficult, but uh, frankly, uh, it, it has been an improvement, and clearly the House has been moving in the direction that the Senate was moving in before of less predictability in what's done. I don't think it's, uh, th there's no easy answer to that because the reasons for unpredictability uh, are, are many uh, for not being able to tell whether a vote will take place at a, at a, a specific time. But it's one of the factors that has eroded the quality of life for members around here that's made, in particular, young people with families get increasingly frustrated and we're losing some of the finest with that being a central reason. And we've got to address that in a way that, that lets people live lives that are reasonable and not as wildly frenetic and uh, seven day, 168-hour uh, uh, jobs as they are now. The scheduling is an enormous problem for individual members and for the Congress as a whole and how it presents itself to the country. And, and, and I think the House has something to learn from the Senate here, which, is, which I almost never say. Mm -hmm. Well, Norm, it's interesting. Uh, I was elected in, in 78, and um, when the first few years I was here, uh, we didn't have this three-day-a-week schedule. Uh, we worked on Mondays. Uh, we worked on some Fridays. Uh, and we ought to be working five days a week. We ought to be working Monday through Friday the weeks that we're here. So I hope that's one thing that, that we do. We also want to uh, <coughs> provide a little public education here. The, the sense of the public, I think, is that when you guys aren't here on the floor, you're not working. 
Uh, I'd like some of the journalists who write about uh, uh, recesses and uh, vacations to spend a day or two back with a member of Congress in the district. Uh, they'd come back totally exhausted uh, and unable to work for a week, I think, if that were the case. Uh, one of the problems with going to a three week on and one week off schedule is that an awful lot of people are going to distort it into you're only working three weeks yes. of the month. Uh, and we have, to, we have to deal with that, and that's part of our function, is to uh, educate people uh, to what real work is. Also, I, I would like to comment on uh, some, make some more general comments and get your reaction. Um, from 1981 to 1991, for a 10-year period of time, I chaired the Democratic Caucus Committee on Organization Study and Review, <clears throat> which dealt with rules changes of our caucus and also dealt with the rules changes proposed by the Democrats at the beginning of each congressional session. I do not think that it is particularly constructive that if we're going to in fact really make significant changes here to have those done uh, primarily in the party caucuses, in the Democratic caucus or in the Republican conference at the beginning of the session. Uh, I think that they ought to be done on a truly bipartisan basis uh, through this committee. There should not be any through the, the special committee that uh, would be set up. Uh, and then after that special committee has uh, made its recommendations, then have a time for uh, general consideration by the entire membership. Um, what we have in, in the rules changes that we have approved at the, in our party uh, caucus at the beginning of the session, those changes, when they're House rules, then are presented as an up or down party vote. And there is no opportunity for the Republicans to have any input in that process. It's worked well. On, in some instances, we've been able to do things we want as a party. But if we're, in fact, serious about making changes on a bipartisan basis, it cannot be done in the party conferences and the party caucuses in December. It has to be done as a part of the regular legislative process after we convene next year. You, you make an important point. The, the Democratic Party is used to reforming uh, almost exclusively through its caucus. Uh, I understand that. There are good reasons for it. There are special responsibilities that accrue to the majority party, and, uh, and it's, it's best accomplished through its, its caucus. But now we're talking about a set of uh, problems and, and solutions to those problems that that have to reach beyond the, the party organizations. The, they will not be irrelevant to this process by any means. And it, again, it may well be that some adjustment in Democratic caucus and Republican conference rules are, are appropriate in the broader context of this reform effort. But overall, I endorse your uh, conclusion. I think you're absolutely right. I would hope, too, that once uh, this special uh, committee has uh, made its recommendations, that there then be the opportunity for, uh, for other members to participate, that there would be some hearings, perhaps before this committee, perhaps before the Rules Committee, because after all, we have jurisdiction over the rules of the House of uh, Representatives, and that then those, that package, whatever it is, be presented on the floor and that it be open to amendment, that it not be an up or down, take it or leave it package that's come out of this special committee of, of uh, well-meaning experts, uh, but uh, is a very, in fact, small committee uh, without the uh, the average member of the House having the ability to participate in this process. I would certainly hope that it would be an extremely open process. Uh, these are important things for uh, for all members. Uh, let me note that we, uh, in, uh, in our efforts, are trying to involve the widest range of current and former members, uh, members, uh, former members who s have served in the executive branch and the courts, uh, and uh, staff uh, and, and others who have observed this process and been a part of it uh, as well. Uh, we recognize that we don't have all the answers, that we hope that we can get some, uh, shed some light on what uh, some of the problems are as well as what some of the uh, correct responses might be by talking to people as well. And of course, we uh, fully intend to try and uh, uh, utilize the expertise and insights of the members of the Rules Committee too. The, the instinct of, of the Democratic leadership and the Republican leadership will be to present this package 
and on one up or down vote. Now, that doesn't mean that all Republicans would agree with that or all Democrats will agree with it, but the institutional instinct of leadership of both parties will be to present a package that cannot, in fact, be changed on the floor. And uh, I think that would present some real problems and some real difficulties uh, if, in fact, we're to have uh, serious reform here. That's correct, and uh, I think that uh, we will be, I would hope that would be made by the Rules Committee. I would hope that there would not be an attempt to short circuit the normal legislative process once, the, uh, once this package is produced, this package of reforms, uh, and just somehow taken directly to the floor under some sort of special procedure that does not permit any uh, opportunity to modify it, because these are serious matters, and um, uh, in fact, the House does need improvement. Any uh, legislative body can, uh, can stand significant improvement from time to time. And uh, I don't think that you're going to have um, real improvement or you're going to have a meaningful improvement if it's a very small group of people who, uh, uh, who present something as being the, the product of, uh, uh, of, their, of wisdom, but not necessarily with the opportunity for, uh, uh, for alteration. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have, uh, I have no other, I really don't have any questions other than just these observations. I've been involved in this process for 10 years now, as I said. I don't, I don't chair that committee of our caucus anymore. Uh, Louise Slaughter, also a member of this committee, chairs that committee. And uh, uh, that committee has done some very constructive things over the years, in particularly in terms of changing our caucus rules. And I'm sure we will continue to do that as the Republican conference will continue to alter the rules of their conference, co covering such matters as how many members how many committees someone can serve on, um, things of that nature, whether you can be the chairman of a full committee and the chairman of a subcommittee of another committee, which you cannot be under our rules, of course, except in certain limited circumstances. So uh, I appreciate your work and I appreciate your suggestions, and I think that uh, Congress is serious about this matter, uh, and I look forward to the end product. Bob McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Everything that needs to be said has been said. All I want to do is just borrow five quick points that uh, my colleagues have already made, specifically uh, with Butler Derrick, but I want to begin by what Tony Bielanson ended with, and that is that having be, being very knowledgeable about how this place works, I hope that you will not discard ideas that come before you as with the suggestion that perhaps this is too radical or too significant. And let me begin with my most important one. For a long time, I have questioned this understanding as to what the Appropriations Committee was needed for. What we do here is not unique. Le state legislatures do this all year, every year. But for a long period of time, as you know, the various committees passed the spending that needed to be done. But then they w felt that they were spending too much, and so they needed to have a super committee that overlooked all of that, and it would really could have been called a budget committee, but instead it was called an appropriations committee. And that was regardless of how much the agriculture committee wanted to give to the farmers or how much uh, the armed services wanted to build, an appropriations committee would kind of keep the lid on that. But what has happened is the inverse has taken place, and, and we see that, that there is no prohibition. Now we have into that m milieu have added the Budget Committee. And my suggestion to you is this, that if the Budget Committee drafted a budget and assigned the various spending limits to the authorizing committees, and the Congress passed it by March 15th, then, without an Appropriations Committee, giving the jurisdiction and authority to those who are most knowledgeable about highways and bridges, and about interior, or about whatever, that once the Agriculture Committee made the necessary cuts in the dairy program and elsewhere to come to the floor inside their spending limit, then the pressure would all be on the various committees to stay within those guidelines. Right now, when the Appropriations Committee comes through and does a budget waiver, all the momentum is that, well, we get a waiver for you, and might as well give a waiver for me, and so everybody votes for the waiver. But if people made the individual sacrifices, such as public works, to come in under the spending cap, or armed services to come in under the spending cap, then when Interior, or when whoever comes in outside of that spending and asks for a waiver, all of the momentum of the rest of the Congress would see like heck. We did our work, you do yours too, and then the internal pressure would be to stay in that limit. Uh, so therefore, the Appropriations Committee is not, is not a part of the Constitution. I mean, it, just, it, it is a two-step process. We have killed the B-2 bomber a dozen times, and the headlines in the New York Times two days ago said 20 of them are going to be built. 
Now, people don't understand how that works. And, uh, and, and I submit that the main reason it is is because of this two-tier process of where, of where you have appropriations and authorization. Now, number two, uh, the joint referral, where every man's a king, no man's a king. And so what we have here is the unwillingness or inability to make decisions. And you have strong speakers across America that say this bill needs to be done and we're going to bring this bill out and if we don't do it, if you don't do it, we'll get a speaker, we'll get a chairman who can. And what we have here is all these little subcommittees, everybody playing their games and nothing happens. I think that you should consider the idea of, of having a prime referral committee and that any <coughs> subsidiary referrals are time sensitive. And if the committees don't act in 90 days or 120 days, they lose their jurisdiction. And, uh, and then finally, I would say this whole idea of, of America changed the day that this happened, uh, when, when, when the, the, the folks came in in 74 and, and uh, developed the voting card so you could vote in 15 minutes. Because it used to take an hour to vote. And uh, you did most of the work in the committee of the whole. And the committee of the whole, they didn't have recorded votes. And then when you came out, you wanted to have a recorded vote. And you had to have 100 people stand. And uh, when some character got up and said, well, I think we'd increase Social Security spending 18% this year, uh, they'd take a vote and the speaker would count and the guy would lose. And then when it come time in the full committee, if he demanded a separate vote, why not, enough people wouldn't stand, he didn't do it. But I remember specifically, and I'll give you an example, of, of the budget agreement in 1985, I believe it was, in which they said that, that they were going to take the COLAs and slip them from October 1st, the beginning of the fiscal year, to January 1st, so everybody got a pay raise on, on January 1st. Uh, no great shakes, 90 days, and yet it saved $14.5 billion. And so they all did that. And uh, when it got to the floor, Everybody could demand an individual vote. And so they demand, what about the veterans that paid their price and bearing the burden of their bodies the freedom of our country? Should they be made to sacrifice an additional 90 days so we had to vote on the veterans? What about the, the military retirees, the people who are dedicated their life, they made this promise, we made a commitment, have a contract, so had to vote on the military retirees, had to vote on, on the uh, Social Security, had to vote on everybody one at a time. Now that didn't happen for 180 years. But it did happen once we got to the point that you have these recorded votes in the Committee of the Whole, and you can do them every 15 minutes. And with that, you had this explosion of special interest groups in Washington with newsletters and voting records of only one vote, only one. And I remember in 1986 when I walked into the, to the Treasury Employees Postal Union in, 19, in October of 86, and they unfolded a big map of the United States and with the various members of Congress, Alpha, Atlanta, Alaska, and Arkansas, and all that. And they said, only one vote, only one vote. He knew what it said, but he put his glasses down, looked down, wanted to see what that one vote was. So the whole, these organizations with all their mailing lists center on one single vote as we've been able to, 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 to so emasculate the system that nobody wants to be caught voting against that one Social Security, that one senior citizen, that one whatever. So I would hope that you would look at, at those three points. Jurisdiction has got to be addressed. The idea, we do have a budget committee. We didn't used to have one. Uh, we have one now. If they did their work, appropriations, I'm not sure would they contribute that much. And I hope you consider my suggestion that uh, uh, recorded votes and with that. Can I, let me sure, just please, add, make one quick not. comment uh, uh, to what you said. I, I'm sorry that uh, David Dreyer wasn't here to hear it. Uh, because in fact, it was precisely that change that brought this explosion of recorded votes on the floor that led to the rise of modified closed rules and closed rules in the Rules Committee. You didn't need to have That's right. uh, anything but an open rule if you had enormous internal limits placed on the number of amendments that could be offered on the floor. And that's why all of this has happened. And if you, if you move to an open rule system now, under the current uh, uh, methods of electronic voting and with television present, we can't do away with those things, we'd have chaos. So we've got to find a different way to strike that balance, and that's part of our task here uh, than simply uh, uh, opening up the floodgates uh, to votes on the floor. Uh, Ms. Mr. McEwen, I'd simply say I think your analysis is acute. I mean, you really, you're really right on with each of the three areas and and I think pointing out the cost of sunshine in the latter one with the with the recorded votes uh, is is very important and as Norm suggests it's tied very much back to the nature of rules uh, operating on the floor of the house these matters would be central to our efforts and I'm sure on the joint committee as well wish you all success thank, thank you. you thank you sorry <clears throat> Mr. chairman let me just uh, in thanking the two uh, the two guests, uh, let me just question somewhat your your uh, your position on the open rule. 
Uh, Norm, you mentioned uh, that there were very few uh, great debates in, the, in this Congress, in either body, uh, but particularly in the House of Representatives. And I can only recall, well, the greatest one, of course, was the Desert Storm debate. I think that was the highest caliber debate that we've had in the 14 years I've been here. I can only think of one or two others during that entire 14-year period. And, uh, but one of the great travesties of, of these modified or closed rules, other than waiving the Budget Act and getting ourselves into this, this deficit uh, situation we're in, the, the real travesty is the, the non-debate that those modified closed rules produce. It is so uh, awful to be able to sit there and watch the manager of a bill, and I manage quite a few, yield one minute to the gentleman from California or Buffalo or you know, wherever he's from. And what he says in one minute is totally useless. It may have some political advantage because he can probably revise and extend, expand that one minute to a uh, half hour uh, uh, written uh, statement. But uh, uh, when we used to bring foreign aid bills to the floor back in the early uh, 80s, late 70s, under an open rule, we would debate those bills, that bill, for five or six days and there would be probably a hundred amendments offered. Um, if they were inconsequential, uh, operating under the five-minute rule, uh, after a period of time, uh, we would uh, then move to cut off the debate and generally do that. But on the more important issues, we would spend uh, one, two, three, sometimes four hours on something important. perfect example of this is what's going to take place later on on the floor today. Uh, we put out a rule, and uh, I agreed to this rule because it was so complex and uh, uh, we had nine committees involved, but uh, we're going to consider something called nuclear plant licensing, which is very important to the entire nation and to the future of the country, depending on which side you're on. And it, uh, we originally were going to allow 30 minutes of debate on that important issue. So after a little negotiation, we expanded it to 40 minutes. Now, we're going to go on the floor uh, with a debate on that important issue for 40 minutes. And members are going to stand up, and each member is going to be able to speak for one minute, some of them two minutes, maybe even three, and they will have said absolutely nothing in three minutes. So, uh, you know, the open rule is, is terribly important. If we're really going to be able to, uh, to debate these issues, you don't, I mean, you recall, I'm sure, from your uh, historical perspective of study, not from your age, that when, in the old days, when the bills were first introduced, uh, I seem to recall reading that important bills were brought right to the floor and they were aired at that time before the speaker put them out to, a, uh, to an assigned committee. And uh, we need to get back to that sort of thing if we're really going to be able to have the meaningful debates and develop good legislation the way we used to. So I just... Uh, I'd just make one sense. suggestion, and, and I think uh, clearly there, are, there, there ought to be ways of striking a balance in terms of amendments offered and debate on the floor. What I'd like to see happen uh, today is that we have a period set aside maybe to replace uh, the uh, special order period today where in fact both parties organize to have a debate on national energy policy Good with idea. designated individuals in an Oxford Union style debate, get the best people to get out there and talk about what we ought to do. That is not something that you have to do by altering uh, the rule for that particular bill necessarily. Uh, and it's something that could be done uh, that you ought to seriously consider in terms of modifying the rules for debate during that period or some other time. And it would be useful for the country. Great idea. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. I don't know what we should do since the bill has. Why don't we just run the vote while you're calling up the next? What's that? Well, I don't know whether we call the next panel. Why don't you just have them come to the table? We'll come right back. And All right. Well, the, uh, we have a vote going on. We'll be right back. So we'll look. Panel number two, consisting of the Honorable John Erlenborn, former member from Illinois. Alan Boyd, Chairman of the Airbus Industry of North America, former Secretary of Transportation, uh, and also accompanied by Roger Sperry, Director of De Development and Operations, the National Academy of Public Administration. See you in a few minutes, guys. Brief recess. Thank you.
a healthy debate. I sure hope so. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, for the opportunity for the uh, National Academy of Public Administration to present its views, uh, which are represented uh, primarily by a study that was recently completed a 140-page report entitled Beyond Distrust, Building Bridges Between Congress and the Executive, which uh, each of you have. The purpose of that study was to understand and improve the relations between the two branches, executive and legislative, and their impact on federal program implementation. We understand this is the thrust of uh, House Concurrent Resolution 192 for the legislative branch. The Constitution invites struggle between the branches, but not hostilities. Uh, the the uh, National Academy conducted a number of case studies which uh, involved uh, congressional uh, participation in program implementation. Uh, we concluded that uh, Congress, in most, if not all these cases, got deeply involved in what uh, the public calls micromanagement for reasons that were valid and rational, uh, but that in so doing, they did not in any way strengthen institutionally either the legislative nor the executive branch, nor was the overall uh, decision-making uh, system improved at all. The executive branch manifested, uh, as a result of our view of these studies, uh, a substantial number of failures, which uh, were really very distressing to the panel. Uh, but having said that, uh, when Congress steps in to implement policy and manage programs, accountability uh, for policy implementation and program management breaks down. And uh, that's something that just cannot continue in our view. Uh, we concluded that basic reforms in the Congress and the executive branch uh, are urgently needed if we're going to have any progress on dealing with national policy. Basic. You've heard it this morning. We have to emphasize it. Lack of trust lack of trust between the two branches, lack of trust within the Congress. Uh, this is something that I don't think can be legislated, but until that lack of trust is somehow bridged with a measure of trust, we're in deep, deep trouble, we think. Congress and the President are jointly responsible for making government an effective instrument. Our recommendations were built around the central premise that each branch must have appropriate internal capacity to engage the other. In, other, in order for Congress to strengthen its broad policy expertise and capacity to fulfill its role, we recommend a systemic review of its organization and legislative processes in both houses. The goal should be to develop broad policy expertise, reduce the conflicts resulting from committee jurisdictional overlaps, and strike a more productive balance between the value of redundant committee involvement and the requirements of effective decision making. <clears throat> In an area familiar to one of the witnesses, transportation, the panel noted that more than 40 committees and jurisdictions and subcommittees have jurisdiction over one or more elements of surface transportation. And I'd like to digress just for a moment to, to talk in terms of some personal experience, which was that uh, when I was serving as Secretary of Transportation, I found that during the spring, during the appropriations season, uh, I was 
giving the same testimony before a variety of committees and subcommittees uh, throughout a substantial period of time. And a large part of that was purely and simply because each one of those committees and subcommittees wanted the secretary personally to be there to satisfy themselves how important that committee or subcommittee was. And uh, uh, I don't say this uh, in, in any lack of respect for the committees or the subcommittees, but the fact of the matter is that these and other issues of a similar type take away from the officials of the executive branch an enormous amount of time which could otherwise be spent in areas where they're not just duplicating something that they've already done uh, in, the, in the same body. Uh, our panel found that despite the recognized importance of oversight and availability of important information, Congress is repeatedly surprised. It often appears to be caught off guard by major and minor executive crises, ranging from the savings and loan catastrophe, the HUD scandals, to lesser matters such as technical failures and cost escalations and modest weapons acquisitions programs. We believe the need for a comprehensive oversight agenda must be addressed. We know this has been tried without much success in the past. We believe the congressional leadership will need more, much more leverage in developing an agenda and enforcing it. A joint committee could be the vehicle for developing sound recommendations to strengthen congressional oversight. Our view of the goal in creating this new agenda should be to focus on critical policy and performance issues, achieve the benefits of a two-year budget process in which the off-year is devoted to program authorization and oversight, require accurate, timely, and reliable policy and program information for the executive branch, and draw from first-hand familiarity with ongoing federally funded operations. Our panel returned time and again to concerns about the growing distrust between the branches. Now, uh, obviously with divided government, there's going to be tension. Obviously the way the Constitution was drafted, there's going to be tension. Uh, there is a vast gap between tension and distrust. And that gap has got to be somehow or other resolved. <coughs> We support the enactment of Resolution 192. We believe that ideal reform initiatives in the two branches should proceed in parallel, but we urge Congress to move now. In reporting the legislation, the Rules Committee may want to provide some guidance to the Joint Committee along these lines. First, this is and should be a Joint Committee. Each House will no doubt want to preserve its institutional prerogatives but they need to better coordinate their structures and activities to achieve common goals. Also, there needs to be a better match between the organization of Congress and that of the executive branch. The effort should go beyond moving the boxes or dealing with internal procedural matters. Congress should see itself not only as the first branch of government, but also as part of a larger system responsible for ensuring effective governance within the constraints of available resources. The Joint Committee should keep in mind the opportunities for taking advantage of modern technology, not only for improving information flows, but also for fundamentally reforming the ways government conducts its business. Congress not only needs to take full advantage of this technology, but also to modify its top-down, legislative, detail approach to policymaking so as to be more supportive of a 21st century government. Finally, the committee should look for ways to provide greater attention to the organizational and institutional issues we've been discussing. The decline in congressional capacity to evaluate organizations and in the jurisdictional authorities of the government affairs and government operations committees who are responsible for these matters have to be re reversed in our view. The National Academy stands ready to assist these committees and will be available for support, specific suggestions, or whatever we can do to be helpful to uh, 
the committee if as and when it is uh, established because I think we all feel very keenly the desperate need to see the Congress again be seen as an effective institution of government in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, seeing some of my old colleagues. Uh, this uh, panel of 18 uh, members that uh, gave direction to the study of the uh, National Academy of Public Administration uh, included uh, Jim Jones, uh, our former colleague, uh, who was chairman of the panel, and also I should mention Dick Bowling, who gave a great deal of emphasis to uh, organizational uh, restructuring of the Congress as a uh, necessity if we were to make the Congress uh, meaningful in addressing the uh, problems that face uh, our country. Uh, and it didn't take a great deal of uh, urging on his part uh, for uh, our panel to make this one of the principal uh, recommendations uh, in our report, a copy of which I understand has been made available to uh, each of you. I think we have to remember, however, and it's been said here earlier today, and I think, by the way, the discussion today was excellent. There were many good ideas, uh, first of all, identifying problems, and secondly, uh, good ideas as to uh, how to address some of those problems. But reiterating what was said earlier, uh, we have to recognize that changing the rules and changing the structure is not going to change the result without the political will to see that that result is achieved. I've noticed in my 20 years here in Congress uh, and since uh, that there is always the search for some change in the rule that will make the result come out automatically without members going on the record and having to take uh, responsibility uh, for uh, the outcome. It just won't work. Uh, and I, I noticed the other day there was a hearing on the issue of a constitutional amendment for a balanced budget. And I noticed my good friend uh, Bill Frenzel, uh, after explaining all of the reasons why it wouldn't work, he said, but we have to adopt it. I'm almost uh, to that point myself with some of these issues that the Congress seems unable to address, and yet I know in my heart of hearts that changing the Constitution, changing the rules of the House, or changing the committee structure won't work unless there's the political will uh, to make it work and unless we have members who are willing to take the responsibility. One of the reasons that they don't take the responsibility uh, has again been discussed here today, and I'd like to, to uh, emphasize it. And that is that each man and woman of the Congress uh, is a uh, independent contractor. Uh, they uh, operate on their own. Uh, there's, it's a stark contrast to what it was when many of us started here some 20, uh, 30 years ago when party was very important, uh, and the denigration of the parties uh, over this period of time has lessened the ability of the Congress to address the tough issues. It used to be that when you ran for office, you had to seek the support of the party. You got your volunteer labor from the party, and a good deal of your funding from the party. Uh, that no longer is true. Uh, and someone said that this uh, place is awash in special interest money. That is true. Campaign finance reform will be very important. We can't address that with this commission or, or co joint committee. Uh, but I, I do say that campaign finance reform, uh, more strength to the parties so that there's a party position. Now, I've noticed, and maybe you have too, you can travel this country in an election year and you see the ads in newspapers and on television and billboards, people running for Congress, and about 99 out of 100 times you don't even see a party designation associated with their candidacy. We've gotten that far uh, from uh, the parties being meaningful uh, in the uh, con congressional structure uh, and in our campaigns. So, as I say, I don't think that the results of this committee will be a panacea, but it is something that is very necessary to do if we're to have the structure so that the political will and some of the other things uh, can be done. Uh, we've talked also here today about seniority. Uh, I was one of those that uh, campaigned to do away with the harsh, uh, strict seniority system, and I think some good things have come uh, from that. 
Uh, however, uh, the other things that have happened, the dispersion of authority uh, from committee chairman to the multiple uh, subcommittee chairman has dispersed authority and, uh, to the point where no one feels res a real responsibility because with authority goes responsibility. And we don't have it concentrated enough uh, for people to feel sufficient responsibility to see that the ultimate uh, right thing is done. Uh, we've talked also uh, today about multiple jurisdictions. I recall when I was on the conference committee uh, uh, for the bill that uh, created what is now called ERISA, we had four committees of the Congress, two from the House and two for the Senate, from the Senate. And that was in 1974 and it was very unusual. Uh, not unprecedented, but very unusual. I noted uh, conferences that are going on today that have participants from eight and nine different committees, maybe not the whole of the committees, and not on the whole bill. Bills are broken down into parts, and you'll have one committee uh, assigned to uh, confer on this part, and another committee uh, as, uh, assigned to confer on, uh, on that part. Uh, and uh, that multiple uh, jurisdiction, I think, has made it very difficult for uh, this place to work. Uh, finally, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, I reiterate the support uh, that my uh, uh, friend Mr. Boyd uh, has uh, expressed, uh, the support of uh, the National Academy uh, and of the panel that conducted the study. Uh, I do recommend uh, uh, that you read at least the, uh, the summary of the conclusions of that panel. It was surprising, as, as Mr. Boyd said, we started out thinking that Congress was wrong in micromanaging. Uh, we still think that the, it does weaken both the, the Congress and the executive branch, but we understand why it has happened. Uh, and uh, maybe a change in committee structure, more oversight, uh, will do away with the need uh, for uh, congressional micromanagement and help to improve the system. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, just as a formal matter, I would like to submit our statement for the record. Without objection, all statements. <coughs> uh, Roger Sperry, Director of Development Operations, National Capital Public Administration. I don't have an additional statement, sir. I just want to thank you for the opportunity for the Academy to be at these hearings. Uh, the Academy was established 25 years ago by Jim Webb, but the idea of being a resource available for managers in government, and that turned out to be principally in the executive branch. But over the last several years, we've uh, uh, had a growing appreciation of the importance and growing importance of the congressional role in the the day-to-day -day operations of government and setting policy, and this study is a result of that. Uh, we will continue to try to be as helpful as we can of uh, the various committees of the Congress and uh, this joint committee, if it's, is, if it's established, uh, to try to bring our expertise to bear on these problems. Thank you. <coughs> well, let me thank um, both of you gentlemen, uh, all three of you. Uh, your testimony was certainly in, enlightening, and uh, uh, Mr. Former Secretary of Transportation, I was on the Public Works Committee uh, uh, during the Carter years when you were there, and uh, uh, I, I remember you having to appear before all these various subcommittees, not just ours, but appropriations, and uh, um, thank, uh, you better be thankful that you're not Admiral Watkins, uh, who uh, had to appear before nine committees and 44 subcommittees on this energy bill that the Rules Committee just finished writing. You didn't know that we wrote bills in, the <laughs> in our Rules Committee, but we do. Uh, your points also on the, um, the two-year budget are very, very well taken, and uh, uh, I would hope that you would, you would pursue that uh, uh, with our uh, joint uh, ability to work together here. Uh, John Erlingborn, you mentioned something that uh, is, is a real problem, and uh, it seems that, you know, years ago, uh, when members came to Congress, and I'll just uh, take a little exception with what Norm Orenstein had to say, because uh, he seemed to infer that today's members of Congress were so much more uh, capable uh, than, uh, than those in, in the past. And uh, I don't think that's true at all. I think maybe when it comes to education, to honesty and integrity, certainly they're on a, an equal par. But there's a, a difference today, and John, you mentioned it when you talked about the, uh, the political guts. You didn't use the word guts, but uh, guts is what it is. But years ago, 
before you were elected to Congress, you normally um, had lived a life of success, either as a businessman, as a professional, uh, as a professor in college, whatever your profession might have been. And you had uh, done a, a, a tour of duty uh, in local government or in the state legislature, and you had a great wealth of background to, uh, to use. And then your party, your political party, picked you, they selected you among all those very capable state legislators or county executives, whoever it might have been, or in the business area. Uh, and they sent you here at an age of maybe 45 or 50 or whatever that age might have been. And they didn't send you here to make a career out of it. And, you know, today, it just seems to me that so many, and this is nothing against the young, but so many members of Congress come here today and they become dependent on this job uh, for whatever reason. And it just seems that they have to feel what's going on out there and they're afraid to say no. And all you have to do is look at all these entitlement programs and, and every time we try to stem the growth of one, the special interest groups come out and uh, somebody mentioned the notch problem, but uh, uh, when these things come to the floor, nobody says no. And maybe that's part of the uh, part of the problem today, but the real problem I think is is that we have so many so many committees, so many subcommittees, and you really don't have time to think and read and discuss and debate the issue. Most members of Congress are just right out straight, and consequently, we almost uh, are reactionary. We we uh, we have a problem and we react to it. Uh, and and we don't we don't get the results we should. So, uh, you mentioned uh, early on that uh, uh, recommending eliminating the ju the jurisdictional overlap. And again, I just think that's so important. But um, how how do you uh, contrast that to some of the testimony that we've heard that uh, that say that we have a broader range of options uh, that would that we wouldn't otherwise have if we didn't have all these subcommittees? I don't agree with that, but. Uh, uh, how do you justify that? I think, the, I think what we're talking about essentially is where, where is the line for the trade-offs? And uh, I don't believe that uh, the Academy has, has drawn the line. I don't think we can draw the line. Uh, I think what we do is just try to provide, uh, along with people like the uh, uh, AEI and Brookings, uh, what are the considerations uh, which which lead the Congress to say, here's where the line should be drawn? Uh, I, I don't think we can state that line. Okay. I, I would agree uh, with Mr. Boyd uh, that there have been some suggestions here today, such as uh, special uh, committees established for a particular large piece of legislation like the Energy Bill. Uh, and uh, Bob McEwen suggested uh, something that I think can be useful. Uh, reduce, first of all, the number of uh, joint references, and probably they should be sequential uh, uh, references, uh, but then have very strict time limits on how long one of the uh, 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 committees uh, can hold on to a piece of legislation. Uh, if you have to have joint referrals, I think it has to be managed much better. I, I might say this, too, uh, uh, Jerry, about how uh, busy members are. You don't realize, uh, sitting here, uh, having been here for so many years and having these duties pile on you little by little, it's like adding weights and you, you get used to them and you don't even notice them. Let me tell you, once you leave here, uh, you realize what a frenetic pace you have been maintaining and you know it, it hits you all of a sudden because it is such a change. When I left here uh, after 20 years I was ranking on the Education and Labor Committee and between the two com uh, my own office and the committee on which I was ranking I had something like uh, 38 or 40 uh, uh, employees and a budget of well over a million dollars and I went downtown the next day and I had half a secretary and no budget. <laughs> and uh, someone said to me, uh, you know, when you're a member, outside events and other people drive your schedule, and that is so true. When you leave here, uh, no matter what uh, endeavor you get into, you find nothing happens unless you make it happen. Nobody is driving your schedule. And it's a very difficult adjustment. 
Well, John, I can I can vouch for that. I don't recall how many years ago you left, but I can recall seeing you then, and uh, you look like an older man ready to retire. Today, he looks like a young man. You and I look like the old man, Joe. But, uh, that that uh, really recommends retirement, doesn't it? <laughs> Your points are well taken. I have a lot of questions which uh, we would like to submit to you, and um, if uh, you wouldn't mind getting back to us with them, we, we won't take up your time here today, but we look forward to continuing to work with you once this legislation uh, is passed and, uh, and we establish the task force. Uh, look forward to a good relationship with you. Uh, I agree with Jerry. I think that uh, there are a lot of people who would like to have their questions submitted to you, and I hope you'll find time to look at them. <clears throat> if you people looked into the area of term limitation, uh, would you be looking into the area of term limitation in your... Uh, we certainly Simon. have not, uh, and I can't speak for the Academy, it would not fit within the study that we did, but uh, the Academy may be willing to get into the whole issue of uh, congressional uh, restructuring. Well, that seems to be a popular uh, cause today, and I was just wondering if you people had looked into it or would be looking into it. That hasn't yet become a burning public management issue, but perhaps it should. Uh, oh. The simple answer is that we have not. Um, I know this has come up in context of is this an issue that this joint committee ought to consider? And it uh, seems to me like that's a constitutional issue that probably ought to be considered okay. by a separate process. That would be probably as much as we have to say on the point right now. You're probably right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. The next panel uh, will be comprised of Professor Roger Davidson, Department of Government and Politics, University of Maryland, Professor James Thurber, Director of Congressional and Presidential Affairs, School of Public Affairs, and Peter Robertson's Principal Partner, Bailey Morrison and Robertson, former House Parliamentarian, former Deputy Staff Director, and uh, I remember him when he was former unshaven. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen. I remember Joe when he had one of them. <laughs> yeah, it didn't take it a long time. Mr. Davidson? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your invitation to appear this afternoon. Uh, I do have a prepared statement, uh, which I would like to summarize only and would hope that it would be included in the record. Without objection, the gentleman's entire statement will appear in the record. My, my interest in the subject of congressional organization goes back uh, to the mid-1960s when I testified before the second Joint Committee on the Organization of the Congress uh, about some of the research that I was doing, and as I was uh, finishing my testimony, a bright young student from Iowa came up and introduced himself. He said, I'm kind of interested in these questions. I've been studying them. My name is Don Wolfensberger, uh, <laughs> and uh, I would, uh, would be interested in corresponding with you uh, on this question. That was in 1965. Uh, so He hasn't forgot a thing you've told him, either. I, I, I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> Uh, to get to the point, I uh, uh, commend the authors of H. Conres 192, and I urge uh, its uh, adoption by this, by this committee. Uh, the two joint committees that we've had, uh, one in 1945 and one in 1965, have made valuable contributions to the Congress uh, in the area of staffing. Uh, restructuring committees, uh, some fiscal reforms were proposed in 1946 that were eventually dropped and then had to be reinvented uh, in the 1970s. Uh, it would have been interesting if Congress had, had adopted them uh, when they were first proposed. And uh, as a footnote, one of the proposals of the 1945-46 committee, the La Follette Monroney Committee, uh, was a Congressional Personnel Office. That was dropped uh, in the other body uh, by senators who wanted to continue their patronage op uh, operations. And uh, if that had been adopted, uh, the House might not have gone through the current uh, problems that it had with the post office and, and, and the bank. Uh, the Monroney Madden Committee in 1960s uh, uh, prepared a Committee Bill of Rights, which I think addressed many of the questions that had to be readdressed uh, in the 1970s. But one of the problems was that the leadership was opposed to this Committee Bill of Rights, and it actually uh, sat in this committee for more than three years uh, before it went out on the floor and was uh, finally adopted in a, in a modified uh, version. Uh, much has been said about the present uh, crisis of confidence. 
Uh, there's no lack of proposals for change. I was looking at a CRS compilation. Uh, there's no less than 97 House measures and 43 Senate measures that have been presented this year, uh, since the first of this year, on this question. Uh, some of these are well worth considering. Others are mainly cosmetic. Uh, still others, I think, including some of the heavily publicized ones, are downright pernicious and I think would emasculate Congress's role. The Joint Committee's uh, responsibilities should be comprehensive, and I think they are in the wording of the resolution. Among the topics that I think bear examining are these. Member schedules and working conditions have already been addressed. We have 20 Senate committees and 87 subcommittees over in the other side of the Capitol. Uh, we have 27 House committees, that's including the select special committees as well as standing. And 149 subcommittees, that's 287 work groups on Capitol Hill, uh, including four joint committees. Uh, the average senator has 11 memberships on committees and subcommittees counted together. Uh, the average House member, seven. Uh, clearly, this has implications for your schedules and for your ability to concentrate on, uh, on the work product. Committee structure, uh, sizes, jurisdictions, and workloads of committees and subcommittees ought to be audited by this joint committee in order to determine uh, questions about uh, optimal numbers of committees and subcommittees, sizes, and even staffing levels. And I would hesitate to recommend any magic number of committees or subcommittees or sizes or staff levels without that kind of updated information that we ought to have. Uh, much has been said about intercommittee relations. Congress needs to do a better job in focusing its energies on problems that spill over committee jurisdictions, as they inevitably will do. And uh, the current and proposed devices, things like multiple referrals, uh, ad hoc committees, which the Speaker has the power to appoint, but which has been very rarely used, uh, task forces, overlapping committee membership, all those things ought to be uh, looked at uh, to make sure that Congress is able better to focus uh, its energies and attention on these problems that overlap uh, committee jurisdiction. Uh, floor proceedings, much has been said about that. As we know, the two chambers go in different directions. Uh, the Senate tilts toward minority rights, the House toward majority uh, rule. Uh, the question, I guess, is whether the two houses have tilted too far in those directions and whether uh, the House uh, perhaps uh, has tightened up its, its floor proceedings too much and the Senate uh, not enough. Those, I think, need to be, need to be looked at. The budget process uh, has also been addressed. What Congress has done in the budget process is to layer on solutions since 1974, which was layered onto the old uh, budget process. And the result has been uh, uh, something of a Rube Goldberg uh, uh, operation that I think members do not understand, and certainly the general public uh, does not understand. And I think that uh, budget process uh, should be once again uh, addressed. Executive branch relations are important, and I would only, as a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, uh, reiterate the points made uh, by the last uh, panel. Judicial relationships, I think, ought to be added to the Joint Committee's mandate. Uh, C Congress finds itself more and more reacting, passing laws, reacting to judicial uh, actions and interpretations. And I think Congress needs to look at uh, it, the legislative judicial relationships. Does it, uh, is it clear enough in statutory language to give guidance to the courts? Uh, are there better ways of monitoring uh, judicial proceedings uh, by congressional committees. I think some com committees do this very well and very completely, others may not. And finally, public understanding. Uh, without uh, suggesting that the Joint Committee uh, uh, launch a public relations campaign, it does seem to me that uh, areas of public understanding, publications, uh, the televised sessions, uh, even the uh, way in which uh, visitors are greeted and treated here on Capitol Hill, might be surveyed uh, to ask whether uh, their quality of these can be improved and their informative value. 
Let me make very briefly, Mr. Chairman, just a few specific comments about the Joint Committee structure. First, I think the members should be members of Congress. Uh, uh, this is the constitutional responsibility of the Congress itself. Uh, I'm uh, <clears throat> disturbed that Congress is sometimes willing to, to uh, delegate its own constitutional responsibilities, particularly in these perilous times. Uh, and I do believe the Joint Committee's members should be sitting members of Congress. Uh, the staffs, I think the, the staff should be uh, not necessarily a large staff, but it should be adequate to the task and uh, uh, it should not get its role and responsibility uh, mixed up with the necessary role of those of us who are on the outside as scholars or practitioners who are going to give advice uh, to the committee. And one other piece of advice, the 1965-66 committee had a small staff that divided in four parts, House Democrats, House Republicans, Senate Democrats, Senate Republicans. Uh, and it was like the, the, the four of them were sitting in four corners of the, of the staff room. And uh, there were rivalries and uh, distinctions. I would hope that, that this staff would be uh, one that would work together in a bipartisan fashion and not fragment uh, as it did in the 1960s. Um, approval by the two chambers, I do have some comments about that. Again, I think it's important that the Joint Committee focus on truly joint matters. Uh, issues uh, with an eye to, to the larger picture, each chamber obviously is going to resolve ultimately questions dealing with its own uh, unique rules and procedures. Uh, in the past, uh, the Senate has designated the Senate members of the Joint Committee to act as a special committee to process the legislation. I believe now the idea is to have the, the legislation processed by rules and administration. Uh, in both 1946 and 1966, uh, this committee uh, on the House side was the Committee uh, of Jurisdiction. I would point out, though, that in between 1966 and 1970, this committee did sit on these proposals, and they were not really brought out uh, until the summer of 1970, almost uh, three and a half years uh, after they were presented uh, to, to this chamber. Uh, one comment about the timing of the uh, Joint Committee's work. Uh, I would suggest the two-stage reporting process. I think it is important that uh, we have some lists of consensus items that might be available for the new members when they come in and are asked to make decisions uh, on uh, structural and organizational matters in the fall, even as early as the early organizational caucuses. However, uh, it would not be possible in that period of time uh, to give the kind of uh, uh, definitive and uh, careful deliberation to the many proposals that I think uh, is desirable. So I would suggest a two-stage process, perhaps an interim or, or preliminary report by the end of October, uh, perhaps at the Joint Committee's discretion, with the final report coming by the end of the first session of the 103rd uh, Congress. Um, finally, I would just uh, reiterate what other people have said, that while the proposed joint committee is a necessary and I think desirable step, I think it would be desirable even in the absence of the present turmoil, uh, it is no panacea uh, for the present discontent surrounding Congress. Uh, the record of the past joint reorganization efforts has not been a totally positive one. There have been failures as well, as there will be. And secondly, uh, structural and procedural defects are only one element, and maybe not the most important, uh, in the present crisis of government that we uh, find ourselves in. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Thurber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for asking us here to testify on H. Conrad's uh, 192. I, I would like to summarize my remarks, and I ask that the entire statement be put into the record. Without objection, the gentleman's entire, record, uh, entire statement will appear on the record. As Roger Davidson first uh, uh, appeared in this room in 1965, I first came to Capitol Hill in 1973 as a congressional fellow to work for Hubert Humphrey and have been involved in the reorganization of the Senate serving on that temporary select committee on committees and watch the negotiations that went on close up in terms of the reduction of committees and alignment of um, 
uh, jurisdictions and other reforms that went through the Senate at that time. I also worked for Dave Obey in the so-called Obey Commission, the Commission on Administrative Review of the House of Representatives, and saw from the House side uh, the problems of implementing reforms. I've written on Congress, and in fact, I have a, a book that's, I hope, in your office, in everyone's office, it's called Setting Course, a Congressional Management Guide. We use it with the Congressional Management Foundation for the orientation of new members of Congress and staff on how to manage their staffs better, how to manage uh, committee staffs better. From that perspective, from writing and, and also involvement inside Congress, I have a few uh, remarks that I would like to make about, uh, first of all, the need uh, for this joint committee. Uh, I endorse it. Uh, and as president of the National Capital Area Political Science Association, the association uh, unanimously endorsed the uh, the uh, H. Conrad 192 in January also uh, uh, as part of the record here. Um, my brief remarks will talk about the need and also the scope of what the committee should do and also timing. And finally, what political scientists, congressional scholars can do and what we cannot do to help the deliberations and the alternative solutions that are, that are generated by the Joint Committee. The need has been clearly stated by all of the previous witnesses. I will not go through all the, the statistics uh, related to the disillusionment that the American public have with Congress, but I will emphasize the fact that it's disillusionment with government generally the presidential support scores in the uh, in in the polls as well as congressional uh, support from the American public are both down as well as support for state and local government so there's a a malaise uh, that is related to government generally and it's not just Congress here it's been over 20 years since the House and the Senate established a bicameral uh, panel to, to study the operations of Congress, as you well know, and I feel that it's, uh, it's time uh, that they do it again. But the panel should focus on improving on its primary functions in this democracy, uh, the function of representation. And we should not forget that this is a representative body, and it's a body that inherently is inefficient. Uh, we should focus also, the Joint Committee should focus on the, the role of lawmaking, also oversight mentioned by N NAPA, and finally education. I think there is a, uh, uh, a misunderstanding by the American people about uh, how this institution works, and I think there needs to be a better way to communicate how the place works and uh, uh, how uh, all of you are working long hours uh, and you're you're getting into the details of legislation and oversight uh, when you're not on the floor. I think there's a lot of mis misperception about the fact that when you're not on the floor, uh, uh, nothing is, is getting done by the American public. The criticisms of Congress today are very similar to the criticisms that came up before the, the Senate Committee on Committees in 1976 and 77. Um, too many committees and subcommittees, too many jurisdictional con uh, conflicts, lack of integrated policy making, too, too much staff. One of the main things that we heard in the Senate uh, during that period from every member, of con uh, every member of the Senate that came before us was that there was too many staff. We should cut back staff. But on the other hand, they would go to the Rules Committee and ask for more staff for their committee. So there was a cer certain... Uh, 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 problem there in terms of what they want uh, and what they said. It's also a criticism of poor scheduling of committee and floor work uh, in, in both bodies, a deadlock over the budget, increasing budget deficits, uncoordinated and, and uh, unsystematic oversight, a lack of foresight. This is the one area that hasn't been mentioned yet before your, your panel, and that is that um, we seem to not have the capacity on our committees to do systematic foresight, anticipating problems. There is the Office of Technology Assessment. It does a, a good job in, in several fairly narrow areas, but each committee uh, in the House and the Senate uh, seems to fall down on foresight. 
foresight long-term planning sometimes is is simply next week or six months from now and I think the committees need to improve that function and of course there's the question of the utilization of members time and and the mismanagement of workload and staff and the congressional support agencies I would recommend that the um, the focus of this of this joint committee be uh, uh, fairly narrow and I say that from experience as a staff member in the Senate it took over a year to do committee uh, realignments in terms of jurisdiction reducing the number of committee assignments and the number of committees and some work with respect to to staff and other rules on the floor a full year and that is only uh, 10% of what has been mentioned as uh, the scope of this committee. I would uh, encourage the committee to focus on uh, the following areas. The committee system, the congressional budget process, the internal management uh, of Congress, congressional foresight, and oversight of the executive branch. Uh, I worked on the NAPA study of beyond distrust. I was one of the principal investigators. I will not focus on the conclusions from that study on oversight, but I recommend them to the Joint uh, Committee and to your committee. Uh, there are some excellent recommendations for improving that. With respect to the committee system, I think the Joint Committee should address questions at this point, and as a scholar on the outside, uh, I'm uh, uh, here to help the Joint Committee and have a proposal uh, before foundations uh, to assist in that also. I'm coordinating with Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein at Brookings and AEI, and my proposal is uh, something that turned out to be very important in the Senate reorganization, and that is uh, we intend to survey uh, members and senior staff and former members, former staff, some uh, people from the executive branch and lobbyists and even some journalists to ask the question what's wrong with the institution and how can we improve it and we feel that the confidential one-on-one -on -one interview with individuals will solicit information that will allow the joint committee to build an understanding of what's possible as well as a, a wide variety of, of ideas Brookings and AEI are holding uh, meetings uh, in focus groups, which is another uh, methodology which is, is excellent and our uh, work with the center and Roger Davidson is working with me on that and, and Walter Olazak from the Congressional Research Service. Uh, we feel that this will, will be an excellent supplement to the work of Brookings and AEI in figuring out um, what can be done with respect to the committee system and, and the budget process and staffing and, and other areas. A few remarks about um, the congressional budget process. Uh, it's one of the areas that I've written on over the last, since 1975 and, and I have uh, several uh, specific ideas with respect to that. They're in the record. I commend you to that and if you have any questions about that we can go into it later. But uh, Roger Davis Davidson is absolutely right. We have a layered on uh, process, starting with 74, Graham Rudman Hollings 1 and 2, and now the 1990 BEA, Budget Enforcement Act. I think we're going to face a major crisis in the, in the budget process once the firewalls, the rules that do not allow transfer from defense to, to domestic come down next budget cycle. I think the Joint Committee should set a high priority and focusing on what is to be done with that budget process next round. And indeed, the problem is the problem, the process isn't, but yet we have a, a, a situation where we may be forced into another summit, an extra legislative phenomena like at Andrews Air Force Base, which is destructive to the institution. I think that that the committee should set a high priority on looking at that budget process and indeed consider um, uh, uh, folding in the functions of the budget committees into the appropriations committees, uh, both in the House and the Senate, and have the, have the appropriations committees consider uh, setting uh, ceilings and um, estimates of revenues and, and the deficit uh, in, in a single committee. 
Uh, others here have suggested that we do away with the Appropriations Committee. Uh, I, uh, I'm not one of those. I think that it's uh, important to have uh, money and authorization committees uh, doing separate work. The internal management of Congress is another issue that I think the Joint Committee should consider. Here, we consider the question of staff. Do we have too much staff? Is, uh, do they have too much power? Uh, everyone seems to jump on the bandwagon of wanting to cut staff. My, my approach to that is let's study to see how they're deployed. Let's uh, indeed figure out whether there are too many. Maybe we have too few staff. Uh, uh, that's not a very popular position. With respect to staff, I think the committee should uh, also focus on hiring practices, compensation, benefits, for congressional staff to bring them more uniformly uh, uh, into pr practice in business outside of, uh, outside of Congress. Improvements in the management of committee and subcommittee staff uh, might indeed reduce the number of staff, uh, but let's look at how they're deployed first and make some decisions about that uh, later. Then finally, with respect to management, I think that uh, the Joint Committee should look at the Joint Accounting uh, Office, uh, the Congressional Research Service, the Office of Technology Assessment, and the Congressional Budget Office the way the OB Commission did to figure out whether there is a duplication of effort among those analytic support agencies and consider realigning some of their responsibilities. So in conclusion, with respect to uh, timing, Timing is an issue be before you and before the Joint Committee. I'm one who feels that the Joint Committee should not rush its inquiry. This is not a study that will take a few months. From my experience in the Senate and with the OB Commission, it's going to take a very long time to, to look at the problems, to come up with solutions, and to build the coalition of support for those solutions. Uh, the Committee should not try to complete its final study and recommendations in six months or by the end of this, um, the, this year, especially during an election year. The Joint Committee staff and others should use the remainder of the calendar year, in my opinion, to identify problems and review what has been done in the past and begin to link the problems with suggested solutions and use the first part of 1993 to come up with the uh, final bill that will be reported to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Peter Robinson. <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, other distinguished members. It's an honor to be here before you this morning on such a distinguished panel of witnesses. Uh, I intend to make my remarks relatively brief. On the subject of congressional reform, uh, I come to you with a slightly different perspective than most of those who speak to you today not as a learned scholar of Congress, but more as a carpenter with a bag of tools well-worn from working with congressional procedures from an entirely practical point of view. The incantations and mystery of procedure have been my profession, first with the parliamentarian's office, then with two speakers, and now as a consultant and strategist in the private sector. <clears throat> I have moved on to perhaps greener pastures in the private sector, but pastures where the grazing depends very much on what Congress does and in what fashion. Unraveling the mystery for those in business and commerce who see advantages and disadvantages in congressional action or inaction can be very re rewarding, but it cannot match the thrill and sense of accomplishment of actually working within these hallowed halls. I'm a firm believer in the principle, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But the majority of opinion, both here and with the public at large, is that something is indeed broke and more than just slightly awry. Change is good, and there are many reforms which may be considered. Almost as, <clears throat> almost as important as restoring confidence in the way Congress operates is the need to bolster the satisfaction, pride, and professional enjoyment of those who are part of this institution. A more professional and efficient system of congressional operations suitable to the 21st century will go a long way towards attracting and keeping the most talented people a tradition this institution has always maintained, despite its regular low standing in the polls, but a tradition which now seems somewhat suspect. The vehicle proposed here to study and recommend congressional reform is a joint study by the House and the Senate. Joint committees have certain limitations, but are probably the most acceptable mechanisms for reaching broad-based consensus, and I would certainly endorse this approach at this time. I would advance one caution, which has been referred to previously, 
about members of one house voting on rules of procedure for the other. All of us with a House tradition have thoughts usually strongly held about how the Senate conducts its business. A general germaneness rule and a rules committee somewhere like this would be of great benefit to the Senate and to us, we think. We shake our heads when we see what the Senate does to our legislation. But the traditions of the Senate, so unlike those of the House, can best be appreciated and changed by those with experience in the Senate. <clears throat> During the course of my involvement with budget reform initiatives and summitry with the Senate, I often saw distress on the part of House participants with the willingness of Senate participants to meddle with House procedure. <clears throat> These attempts all often involve proposals which would have made it harder to, to do business in the House. So my primary caution about the Joint Committee <clears throat> is some kind of explicit understanding that uh, recommendations that go to the joint operation of the two bodies, uh, to their support institutions and the like, ought to be recommendations that the whole Joint Committee considers. But I think there ought to be some kind of firm understanding that where it comes to House rules, unique to the House, uh, that perhaps only House members ought to be voting on those recommendations and forwarding them. As to other language in the document creating the Joint Committee, I wonder whether it is necessary to have advisory members from the private sector. Certainly the committee would be able to cast its net in a wider fashion and call upon a variety of people from the outside to assist it in its work, rather than to elevate specific individuals for that task. I would like to briefly address some of the areas of possible reform and make some observations, with the caveat that rules can only do so much. And it seems to me that part of the mandate of the Joint Committee is to address broad solutions and not necessarily rules changes. <clears throat> First, as to the subject of the budget process and congressional budget procedures specifically, <clears throat> those of us who deal frequently with the budget and deficit reduction statutes approach the subject with confusion and a certain amount of dread. It would be comforting to think that an enduring system of budgeting could be established without major change every two or three years under crisis conditions. Multi-year budgeting might result in a more reliable and predictable system and preserve the authority of Congress relative to the executive branch. The present structure has resulted in an efficient and in some cases virtually non-existent authorization process and multi-year budgeting could assist in reversing that trend. The patchwork of procedures throughout the Senate and House rules the Budget Act and various statutes could be made more con cohesive, consistent, and approachable. <clears throat> that subject leads me into another which hasn't really been addressed, and I'm not sure whether it's in the mandate of the Joint Committee, but you might consider it. <clears throat> the similar patchwork of procedures for congressional approval or disapproval of executive branch proposals, which are contained in a string of disconnected statutes. <clears throat> the Trade Act, the Impoundment Control Act, and many other statutes containing congressional procedures are listed at the end of the House Rules and Manual. No two statutes are the same, although some are alike. <clears throat> this very committee has been called upon frequently to vary rules in those statutes, consistent with the constitutional authority of the House to make and to change rules at any time. Some review with an eye towards consistency and utility might be taken of this body of law. Far too often, the Senate has prevailed upon the House to enact these statutes for obvious reasons. <clears throat> Some other miscellaneous matters uh, that might be within the purview of the Joint Committee are an all overall look at the House rules and uh, their consistency with an eye towards their modernization. As with these uh, executive disapproval statutes, there are many cases within statutes and within the House rules where matters are privileged for consideration. Some are of high privilege, some are of highest privilege, some are in order at any time. I think it might be time for a review of how these all fit together, whether they're all necessary. I had the, uh, the occasion to make a presentation before the Congressional Commission on judicial tenure removal and disability a couple weeks ago. And we got into discussing how the House considers impeachment, for example. And should we still have a system here where any member of the House can, on his own initiative, rise on the floor of the House and move to impeach a federal officer or a judge? Some review might be 
taken of this whole process and whether House rules are to recognize in some structural way this high constitutional responsibility, at least with a threshold of some kind of committee action or consideration. <clears throat> Finally, I'd like to address some of the points that have been brought up previously. <clears throat> On timing, I agree that the Joint Committee ought to have discretion as to when it reports. I think that having any serious recommendations forwarded uh, with the idea of having them considered in the organizational caucus would necessarily lead to polarization. We all know how that's considered at the beginning of the Congress. The majority offers its rules changes on opening day, kind of as a show of force, uh, just after they've elected their speaker. And the minority has its own proposal. <clears throat> These are always at odds. Especially with a large number of new members coming in who will only just be learning about the rules of the House, it seems to me that this is not the proper forum to accomplish any real change, that it's going to take serious time and months of study. I would state that, per, that perhaps there's an opportunity in December to cut committee sizes with so many members leaving. I'm, I'm not sure you're going to be able to accomplish that from a political point of view, however. <clears throat> On leadership powers, and that kind of brings me into committee jurisdiction, it has been suggested that the Speaker has actually more power on the books now than any Speaker has had in recent history, and that's certainly true. For example, the Speaker's referral authority uh, under Rule 10 is almost unlimited. He could do almost anything that has been suggested here on referrals. As a lone voice on the energy bill, I know it's been frustrating for everybody dealing with all these committees, but what happened on the energy bill was that you did have a committee of primary jurisdiction. You had sequential referrals to other committees with a seriously limited time frame. Part of the problem, of course, is that the bill has been broadened beyond belief. Uh, and we can only wait to see if that actually produces better legislation or not. <clears throat> Seems to me the real solution there, and we have some history on this point, energy jurisdiction. With the demise of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, we had the Patterson Committee to realign energy jurisdiction. What we've ended up is the hodgepodge we basically had before. What you need is some serious realignment of committee jurisdiction. And I agree that there are some minor committees that might, that might be combined with others, and that new committees might be created to give an umbrella to miscellaneous powers held elsewhere. This is one part of congressional reform that really takes guts. Uh, we all know what happened with the committee reform amendments in 1974. It developed a system of multiple referral but did not drastically realign committee jurisdictions in a way that was suitable for multiple referral. Having been with the Speaker on jurisdictional decisions, I can tell you it's one of the biggest headaches for the leadership. <clears throat> You're damned if you do, damned if you don't. You don't please anyone. It's very hard to figure out the equities. Basically, what we have with the multiple referral system is a system where rights are never finally adjudicated. There is a perpetual hunting license for any committee to go after another piece of legislation based on some hook in its jurisdiction. Somehow this problem has to be addressed, for there has to be some predictability in the system and some established rights on, the, on behalf of committees. As to ad hoc committees, uh, they were very useful for the energy bill and for the outer continental, continental shelf leasing situation. I think the problem with ad hoc committees is, uh, first of all, it takes time. You have to combine a whole new staff, get it up to speed, combine from a variety of different committees. When you're finished with that legislation, which may be a very good product because of the ad hoc committee system, you're still left with, with fractured jurisdiction after the fact. And you may have massive bills that re require all kinds of regulations by the federal government and the oversight will remain as fractured as it was before the ad hoc committee. So I don't think it's a permanent solution to, uh, to major multi-jurisdictional bills. As far as the budget process and the committees, of course we had ways and means and appropriations together until about 
budget committee and that perhaps the budget committee ought to be returned somewhat to its role of handling macroeconomic issues and setting overall levels. <clears throat> As to committee operations, uh, I believe there are too many subcommittees that the, that is the so-called reform of requiring so many subcommittees has not worked and that you have the fractured type of jurisdiction within a committee that you have among committees in general. And also that committees are too big. <clears throat> that concludes my remarks. I hope there's some questions and I'd be happy to uh, respond to future questions or give whatever assistance I can. Thank you very much. Peter, uh, Dick Bowling had a philosophy. He said, uh, the way you put people on committees, if they come up and ask for armed services, put them on agriculture. He thinks that people come up and ask for committees that are so important to their districts, and therefore they become a, an almost an in-house lobbyist for the, the industry or whatever appears in a district. Mm -hmm. How would you assign, uh, if you know, how would you assign people to committee assignments? Uh, I don't really have a recommendation because it's so uh, essentially political. Uh, I think there's perhaps, as far as the proposition that members ought to be on one committee, uh, I do believe that that could that sidetrack members into uh, uh, dismal careers, to be perfectly honest. And uh, I don't see a one committee system as working unless there is going to be some kind of rotation and uh, spreading, spreading around. Uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, members, as with staff, develop areas of professional responsibility. And uh, I think that the leadership of any committee ought to have been there for a while to, to master the system. Uh, the system by which the parties choose committees could probably use some scrutiny. You might want to, of course, this is a more a question of caucus rules and party policy than it is of House rules. But I assume that the Joint Committee will be making recommendations in that area as well. Also, Peter, uh, there's some discussion by some of the panelists about educating the public to the ways of Congress. I think C-SPAN has done that greatly. And I think the, the print the media has also done it. So I, I don't know any other ways that you could educate the public. Well, I don't either. I, a, a personal comment in that regard, I remember back in the early 1970s, before the committee reform amendments and the Congressional Budget Act, uh, when Ralph Nader had a platoon of students combing Capitol Hill, and they uh, dug up details in every member and issued one-page summaries of each member, their philosophy, their powers, their whatever, uh, with the justification, and it was somewhat justified at that time, that too little was known about members and uh, their areas of responsibility and what, what they were like. And it seems to my, me that now we've gone full, full circle and that uh, the media spends far more time on the most intimate details of everyone's life. Uh, and there's someone somehow has to be a leveling of that trend. And of course, the media bears a lot of the responsibility here, but perhaps there's some kind of measures that the Joint Committee might recommend as to the relationships between this body and the press. Thank you. Mr. Billinson. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. I don't really have any any questions, uh, which is not to say that, that I did not find, because I did, as I'm sure my colleagues did, the testimony of all three of these gentlemen, as well as the preceding panels, extremely interesting and, and extremely helpful. It's just as it's obvious, I mean, we've, we've spoken about all the things I, that we, we should be getting into, probably not much else. Uh, to cover, but it's pretty obvious it's an awfully, as we, as we mentioned earlier, Mr. Chairman, a couple hours ago, I guess, that it, it's, a, it's an awfully full menu, an awful, awfully big plate of things. When you look even just specifically at, at, the, at the major issue which everybody mentions, uh, which is also the most difficult one, which is committee jurisdiction, and you start thinking seriously about that, this is enormously complicated as well as being enormously difficult to, to affect change around here because of the of protection of turf and, and, and so on. But it, it also reminds one that even though some of us are anxious, and properly so, I think, to get as much done as possible as quickly as possible, or at least something, something substantive done quickly, if at all possible, especially to take advantage, as we've all discussed earlier in the, in the day, of this large incoming group of people next year so that 
we can give them something useful to do as you know in place of simply destroying the place uh, and also to, to get them on board before they before they themselves acquire some some turf they want to protect uh, it would be it would be, it'd be, would be good if, if if this committee we're about to, to create I hope we do uh, comes up with some things which we can which we can do uh, soon on uh, and it may be may well be that we can we can agree amongst ourselves or they can and then we subsequent to that can agree across party lines on, on at least some very useful things that we can do at, at first but nonetheless one is reminded when these these learned gentlemen go through the the list of things which ought to be looked at and obviously there are some things beyond that which others have spoken to that there's an awful lot for us to look at and it's really quite complicated uh, it's not yet obvious to most of us, I think, where we ought to come out, what exactly ought to be done. So we're going to have to take some time and we're going to have to have some patience and, with the, and work with the understanding amongst all of us that uh, it's worth doing and it's worth doing well and that we'll hopefully at the end have something very useful to support which will make some substantive and real changes around here. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Thurber, I think you were ready to jump in there one time. Yes, uh, I just wanted to say, and I didn't mention it in the testimony, that we intend to uh, survey the freshmen also. Uh, why, don't educate, why don't you educate them as well as survey? Well, maybe the survey will help to uh, focus their, their ideas uh, and, and what they feel the problems are. I know I've been involved in orientation of freshmen and... and they apparently feel the main problem is the House Bank, but yeah, which is right. our friend Vin Weber said has been gone now for some months. And the restaurant and a few other right. perks that are... The problem is the food work. in the restaurant, not, not right. the restaurant. <laughs> but from the freshmen, we may get an idea about uh, some of their ideas, and I, my hypothesis is that they, uh, they're all over the place in terms of what should be done, and they probably don't understand in great detail uh, the way the place works. Actually, it's very interesting, your, your, your proposal, because, as you yourself just suggested, uh, in the process of submitting to them a list of questions or, or whatever, you know, asking them how they, what they feel ought to be done, you quite obviously can suggest to them areas which they probably, most of them, will never have thought about before and start sort of nudging them toward the realization that some of these things are really quite difficult and quite complicated and, and are deserving of some real thought on their part. Hopefully, we will not bias them in our research. We'll try to be objective, but you're right. At least it, it will get them to focus on some of these problems that we're discussing today. Unless in the you show. and we can all agree ahead of time as to which direction you ought to push them, maybe we can agree on some <laughs> subjective questions. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, pursue the line uh, which, which we've been going through here. Um, the, the points that Tony raised were exactly what I wanted to discuss. I thank you all for your very helpful testimony. It seems to me that we've got a very unique and unusual window before us. And uh, Pete mentioned the fact that with all these new members, we might look at the prospect of reducing the size of committees. There's already been talk from some of the exclusive committees. The Appropriations and Ways and Means Committees have already indicated that the idea of reducing the size of those committees is something that has appealed to at least the chairman of those committees. And it, it uh, also seems to me that as we look at the uh, prospect of rotation, maybe, instead of simply limiting the, the uh, number of committees on which a member can serve, uh, would be something that uh, that we ought to take uh, take under advisement here. I guess, and you know, Dr. Thurber, you mentioned this three and a half year period of time that it took from the report to actual implementation of one of the reform packages that that uh, came about. It seems to me that that we could get to the point where we come up with marvelous recommendations and uh, nothing happens. And I, I'm afraid that if we wait on into next spring, that there's a chance that that could happen. And, uh, so, and, and Tony's right in that we should educate the incoming freshmen. But we should also realize that that's going to be a unique opportunity for us. Those of us who are still here will get some real recommendations coming from the front line, so to speak, that being the, the perspective of a candidate running for the United States House of Representatives, listening more closely to the people, maybe than some incumbents uh, listen to the people. So I think that we, we might have a, a chance for actual implementation. I hope we do it early on. But, but now, um, this spring through the summer, and as we look towards this 
proposed is you'd like to see October 30th uh, interim report. Uh, a very unique opportunity. So I guess what I'm asking is, how, how do you all, what, what do you think would be the best route for us to, to seize on this unique window that we have here? Well, I think that if there is an interim report, I think that the report should look at uh, clearly at what the problems are, diagnose the problems, because uh, in much of the discussion about reform, people jump forward with, uh, with a reform proposal without thinking about the consequences of it and without linking it to a, a specific problem. Size of committees, in my opinion, is a problem, but if you look at size of committees and you do not realign committees at the same time and maybe reduce the number of committee assignments and number of committees, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't do much. I think you, you need to take, take a comprehensive uh, approach to this and maybe uh, the Joint Committee could do this by September. I don't think so because I'm limited from my own experience in the House and the Senate when these efforts were done in the past. The one problem uh, that is lurking behind all of our <coughs> considerations, I think, is the, uh, is the how to mesh the, the plans with the politics mm -hmm. of it. Uh, and I've studied all of these uh, uh, reorganizations and I've been involved in some of them. I think Congress would be better off today if they had adopted each and every one of those proposals, uh, by and large. Uh, Certainly there were mistakes, but in every case, uh, those proposals and those plans that were agreed upon by bipartisan committees or joint committees, uh, many of them fell by the wayside because they didn't mesh with the power structure uh, of the House and Senate at the time. And over and over again that happened. We're complicated in, in, at this moment in history because we don't quite know what that power structure is or certainly is going to be after November. And um, that's the political, that's mm -hmm. a political problem, a political equation uh, that we don't know the answer to. Pete talked about the, uh, the go ahead, Dr. Thurber. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that and say that one of the reasons that the Senate Committee on Committees was successful, in my opinion, was related to what Roger just uh, focused on, and that is, uh, they took into account where the power structure was and when you reduce committees, rationalize jurisdictions, reduce the number of committee assignments, you ultimately engrandize. You give people who have power more power. Mm -hmm. And it's a very hard thing to do in the House of Representatives because you have so many committees and subcommittees. That's what we did in the Senate. We gave the people, the barons, the chairs more power and that's why it went through because they coalesced together and pushed it through on the floor. Um, that's the most difficult aspect of committee realignment here in the House of Representatives. You have, you have so many people that, in my opinion, will be uh, reluctant to jump uh, on, on this bandwagon and, uh, for realignment because they have so much to lose. Mm -hmm. uh, just another thing about timing. Uh, the, the one advantage you do have with so many newcomers is they don't have that investment in their committee memberships. Right. And that, ideally, would be the time. Well, that, that's why. Uh, but, but go back to the Senate committee reorganization, which was relatively successful in which both Jim Thurber and I participated on the staffs of. We were uh, starting, we had started our activities just about now uh, in, the, uh, in the year, uh, May, June. Uh, we worked full tilt. Uh, had a committee report by the end of the fall, as I recall, and they even uh, delayed committee assignments as the next Congress uh, met in order to give the Senate the opportunity to reach some tentative agreements about what those new committees were going to be. Now ideally this would be, uh, this would be the time. On the other hand, it is a very difficult thing to do and the House committee structure is, is more complex than the Senate. It's, there are more bodies involved and for the members the committee assignments are more important than they are in the Senate. So I'm worried that there is not the time to do what I think would be desirable to do, and that is uh, go to the committee jurisdiction and numbers and sizes question first uh, while you have the opportunity of so many members coming mm -hmm. in that, that don't have the investments. Right. That's what I was referring to as far as this unique window that we have here. Pete talked about the, uh, the great power of the, the, the speaker today. 
And Dr. Davidson, you referred to the fact that if you look at the House and the Senate, we've seen uh, um, maybe more openness in the Senate and a greater level of, of uh, constraint here in the House. And I wondered if you'd care to comment. Uh, we heard uh, from Norm and Tom earlier about the the issue of open rules. That's the case that we consistently make here. And, and uh, as, as we've been saying time and time again, as we debate a restrictive rule on the House floor, since 1977, we've seen the number of restrictive rules move from 15% at that point to 65% in this Congress. So I just wondered if you have any, any thoughts. Uh, and, and, and actually, earlier, Tom was talking about the problems of having too many open rules back then. I wondered if you all have any thoughts about that issue. Well, I guess I'd rather not be pinned down on specifics of what I would propose or suggest. Just because you're sitting under the nose of Chairman uh, Oakley here? Uh, <laughs> but I would stipulate a, a general way, uh, and I can, uh, the first stipulation. And then, by the way, the reason, I brought, the reason I brought it up is that you, you raised the question. I understand. That, that, uh, I would have yeah. never thought of discussing an open rule. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I'm sure of that. Uh, uh, but uh, I would be willing to stipulate that certainly the other body and I can do that with immunity here, uh, needs to tighten up its uh, floor procedures a great deal. And I would say in general uh, that, that this body ought to look uh, with seriously, and I would look favorably to uh, taking some steps that would uh, perhaps open up the floor process somewhat. So long as one were sure that uh, the kinds of amendments that could be structured, the kinds of debates that could be structured on the floor uh, would not be uh, frivolous, mm -hmm. uh, would not be the kind of uh, motherhood and country amendments that would be dangerous and that frankly Republicans as well as Democrats would rather not uh, uh, have addressed, uh, I think, on the floor. Within that context, I, I, I'm sympathetic with the thrust of your mm -hmm. remarks. Dr. Thurbridge. Uh, I basically agree with, yeah. with Roger on this, except I would focus on the other body. I think they need to to uh, uh, do something about uh, the, their uh, germaneness rule or lack of germaneness rule and also the the filibuster, although I understand it's a different body, they have to protect minority rights over there, uh, intense minorities, and uh, I would not, uh, I disagree with Roger with respect to the, to the open rule here. So maybe if there's a committee on reorganization in the Senate, you might from that perspective be able to talk about our concerns over here then. Uh, uh, l l let me, uh, let me just ask if you'd want to respond to any of the specific questions that I posed earlier to uh, to uh, Norm Ornstein and and to Tom Mann about the issue of a Joint Intelligence Committee, and you already raised Pete the, the question of one committee. You you responded to that, or some of the other specific items that I got into. If you all have any comment on any of those, so that I won't seem too agreeable to uh, your uh, some of your premises, I would say I'm a, I'm generally opposed to joint committees with legislative jurisdiction. Uh, I think joint committees uh, have historically been more effective in, in um, um, investigations, staff operations. Uh, so would you concur with Norm point. then on the issue of yes. the joint staffs then, like the uh, Yes, I certainly, I certainly would, uh, could concur on that, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. I think the, uh, uh, the uh, Joint Committee on Banking is an excellent example of, a, of an outstanding staff. The only problem is they can't hold on to them. They go into the executive branch frequently and into the private sector. Which committee is that? Uh, taxation. Taxation. Joint oh, taxation. No, I said right. banking. I right. mean, taxation. Right. Right. Joint Committee on Taxation. It's, it's a great example of right. building expertise in, in a, uh, for the uh, Finance and Ways and Means Committee. I'd like to speak to something that the, that the committee should not do and I think that the press will ask for it or expect it to do something in these areas, and that is uh, campaign finance reform. Other panels are handling that. Uh, I think that uh, one of the perception of the American people uh, that one of the major problems with the institution is that uh, is the way members collect and spend money in campaigns. I, uh, it is not within the language of this uh, concurrent resolution, and I, I think that's appropriate 
Secondly, Senator Levin and others are looking into the regulation of lobbyists and lobbying. I think it's appropriate not to include that in this uh, 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 joint committee study also. And uh, I think that maybe the press will be pushing for that at the same time that these efforts are, are going on. And I think it's appropriate that they're excluded. Pete, did you want to? Yeah, as far as the joint committee is concerned, I think a joint oversight committee on intelligence with a joint staff might be a very good idea. I, mm -hmm. Like Roger, I, uh, I think joint legislative committees don't work. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's just unseemly for members of the Senate to be voting on what's afforded to the House of Representatives. Thank you very much. I certainly hope that, uh, that we are, Mr. Chairman, going to be able to move ahead in a timely fashion here and get something that will be agreeable all the way around. I hope so. Thank you very much for your testimony. I thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Ms. Slaughter, do you have some questions? I, I do, just a couple, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, I welcome you here today, and uh, all of us uh, look forward to this joint committee working well, and we all have a stake in seeing that it does. Uh, however, just in case I play the Julia Butler Hansen role here in the House as uh, chair of uh, OSR, and uh, we are moving ahead ourselves on, on some kinds of reforms. I've looked as well and, and read many of your writings, so it's really a pleasure to see you here today. Uh, the reform efforts in 46, 70, 74, 79 um, were very wrenching. And there was very little consensus. And I know the bowling uh, commission in, in particular um, at least there are some indications and some people who tell me that it fell apart because of outside interests, outside the House. Now, how do we avoid that? Well, it's hard to avoid those interests. Uh, from the experience of the Senate, once you begin to change one bit of jurisdiction, the interest groups and the agencies get very concerned because they have well-established relationships with, uh, with these people. What we did with the environmental uh, jurisdiction in the Senate, and I worked on it, on the Environment and Public Works Committee jurisdiction, is that we um, <coughs> informally got together with the interests, uh, in this case environmental groups and other groups, mm -hmm. and, and had a treaty of sorts uh, to agree that uh, this was uh, at least somewhat acceptable to all of them. That seems strange. It seems that you should be independent of them, but you are not, and it's going to be very difficult unless you build coalitions with those that are affected by changes in jurisdiction, in my opinion. I think for the, for the uh, that's going to be more difficult for the Joint Committee than it would be for us, because we traditionally have been there just making sure that people aren't serving on too many subcommittees. And, uh, but the convergence of the calls for reform and the fact that we exist I think gives us an opportunity this year, the, um, the, the, concurrent almost with the Joint Committee, that with new members coming in, we should should be able to make some changes. And we are, are looking uh, at some of the things that you had mentioned already about subcommittees. Do we have too many? Uh, jurisdictional questions. What can we do? What can we do about conference reports that come back and uh, are totally unrecognizable to us in the way they left the House? Uh, what to do about proxy voting? Those are just some of the issues that we've, we've been looking at. Um, but I, uh, my sense of it, and I, I don't, I, I hope this doesn't sound cynical, and I'm afraid that it's going to, but I think that all the recommendations that we get for reform are really people saying to me, let's go back to what we used to do. So that reform seems to be almost, reform seems to be cyclic to me, that, that, that undoing what had been done before. Um, and you were saying, and, and I was called out of the room, unfortunately, that you thought the speaker had an, an awful lot of power. Would you? discuss that uh, there's that's quite a debatable issue here as to whether we continually blame a speaker who really hasn't the power to do to, uh, to either to make the appointments or the authority to make the changes that we expect of him on the other hand people who think that the speaker is inordinately powerful I'd like to have your opinion on that well uh, I think when we look at the strength of party leadership generally uh, it's on the books, they have certain uh, uh, powers, uh, the referral authority, the uh, really a major impact on who gets on the steering and policy mm -hmm. committee and, and who gets on the rules committee. The committee on committees is no longer with the Ways and Means Committee. You know, it's, it's really under, under the arm of the, of the speaker. 
However, when you look at party leadership, you have to look at how people are recruited and selected to run for public office, and they're, they're running independent of the party. You have to look at party organizational power outside of Congress when you look at the Speaker's power. When you've got uh, individual entrepreneurs getting their own political action committee money, having direct access to the media, when they come back here and get on their committee, they really don't need the party that much, as we've seen with uh, uh, the difficulty in, in bringing discipline and, and, and a clear mission for either of the parties when bills go to the floor. So on the books, there are uh, uh, quite a few powers that were put in during the period 68 to 73. Uh, but you have to put that in the context of a weak party organization outside of Congress, in my opinion. Anybody else? Okay. I think it's hard to generalize. Uh, the formal powers of the Speaker uh, are greater now than at any time since the overthrow of, uh, of Uncle Joe Cannon in, in 1910. Uh, much is said about the power of uh, Sam Rayburn. Uh, Rayburn uh, uh, was a powerful leader in, in, in his personal style and in his domination of the procedures of the House. Uh, but he did not uh, control his own rules committee, or he didn't, uh, that is, he didn't have the kind of influence, I shouldn't put it that way, uh, with the rules committee that uh, speakers later uh, obtained. And he operated within a very uh, greatly divided party between the southern uh, branch and, and the northern more liberal branch. Um, so it's hard to generalize. Uh, the, Parties uh, on Capitol Hill are more important today than they've ever been, in my uh, uh, observation. Political. Party voting is higher than it has been, and indeed, partisanship uh, is one of the uh, one of the complaints that that people have about um, uh, what is going on on Capitol Hill. So I haven't noticed a lot of that. I guess maybe I'm, I'm I'm missing that on our side, but we don't particularly feel we have any great party discipline in the Democrat Party. Well, you know what Will Rogers said about the Democrats. That's he said, right. I'm a member of no organized political party. I'm a Democrat. Right, and there's also that other great saying that when, when Democrats get up a reform caucus, they form a circle and start to shoot themselves. But um, I came from a state legislature, as did a number of my colleagues. The, the, the Speaker of the Assembly in the state of New York is an extraordinarily powerful person. I guess maybe in contrast it would make some difference. But there have been some suggestions here that perhaps steering and policy could be strengthened, um, or, that, or that there might be a better way to move an agenda, which is something many of us worry about, if steering and policy was composed of committee chairs. Have you given any thought to that? Uh, I think that uh, the, the necessary resources are there now for the speaker to appoint individuals or influence the appointment of people that would uh, go along with what the caucus wants and what, and what he wants. I think the problem is the, is the caucus. I think the problem is frequently the caucus cannot come out with a clear position because there are so many conflicting uh, constituencies, and I, I don't see that changing with the, uh, with the chairs of the major committees uh, on steering in, in policy, but uh, I might be wrong. Well, I'd sure welcome the opportunity as we move on with our well, many reforms here to have an opportunity to speak with you again. And thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. You very much. Thank you. All, of all of the panelists were outstanding, and I thank you all for your contribution. And you'll probably be receiving requests uh, from this committee for some of your statements or, or else requests to answer some of the questions from the committee coming to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But in rule stands adjourned. For more information on this hearing, write to the House Rules Committee, H312, in the Capitol, Washington, D.C., 20515. 
This program note, join us Thursday on C-SPAN 2 for live coverage of the United States Senate. Our coverage begins at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Coming up next, Defense Secretary Cheney talks about U.S. national security in a post-communist world. From Washington, D.C., this is C-SPAN 2, a cable satellite public affairs network. Here's a look at our schedule.